Uh, six o'clock uh, is the time. It's a Monday morning, 15th of April. Start of a new day, start of a new week. Very nice to see you. Yeah, and you're tuned into breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. We're with you all the way until half past nine this morning. Uh, the headlines on this Monday. World leaders call for calm as Israel vows revenge against Iran following those attacks over the weekend. Rwanda back in the headlines today as the government teases the prospects of flights within weeks. Yes, it's two years exactly since Boris Johnson announced this plan to send people to Rwanda. Parliament is back today. There will be votes. The government is confident of getting this bill finally into law in the next few days and people on flights to Rwanda by early June. I'll bring you more shortly. OK, the first of four criminal trials against Donald Trump begin today in New York as he faces charges over hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels. And our debate at seven this morning with more than 11 million sick notes issued last year. We'll be discussing whether we need a crackdown. And in the sport this morning in golf, Scotty Scheffler uh, gets his second green jacket in five attempts as he wins the Masters. Arsenal and Liverpool get a little bit wobbly in the title race and in Germany, the first new champions that aren't by Munich for a very long time. It's been a breezy and showery start to the morning, but there will be some sunshine on offer this afternoon. Join me later for the full forecast with all the details. Uh, we're all still talking about those drone attacks on Israel on Saturday night. World leaders now calling for calm after Israel vowed revenge against Iran. Uh, the US has told Israel it won't participate in any retaliatory strikes. On Saturday night, around 300 missiles were dispatched by Iran, 99% of which Israel says were brought down before entering the country. OK. Uh, the Prime Minister here, Rishi Sunak, uh, yesterday confirmed Britain's involvement in uh, shooting down many of those missiles is what he had to say. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. Well, joining us now in the studio to discuss this and much more, the implications of all of this, Defence Editor of the Evening Standard, Robert Fox. Robert, um, people say, I mean, and you can take all of this with a pinch of salt, 99% of these drones were, were, were shot down. Were they? Did any hit targets? I think about eight or nine did, maybe up to a dozen at most. They were a very mixed bag. Uh, there were drones, there were cruise missiles, which travel very slowly, and one or two um, uh, strategic uh, missiles, quite serious stuff. It all looks a bit orchestrated to me that uh, everybody knew it was going to happen, even the US commander who had flown in to help Israel direct uh, against a possible attack, which they knew was coming from Iran, left almost hours before it happened, pretty confident that things were going to be all right. And uh, Iran has got thousands of these things mm. left still. Everybody is looking around and drawing lessons from it. Israel will certainly strike back, but being Israel, I think they won't strike back in a very obvious way. And I would think targeted assassination rather than a big ground attack. That's interesting. I suppose the comments from President Biden overnight that take this as a win, the fact that they intercepted so many of these missiles, I mean, they haven't necessarily gone down that well in Israel, those comments. But do you think that, you know, in that war cabinet room, they'll be saying, let's bide our time, let's be careful with Iran. This is not the same as Hamas in terms of an enemy. What has happened is that it's actually got the Prime Minister bin Netanyahu out of a lot of the problems that he was facing. It was alleged that he was facing a divided cabinet, as well as people in the Knesset uh, ramping up opposition to him, demonstrations. Now, one of the critics, former chief of staff, Benny Gantz, leader of the opposition, but in the war cabinet, absolutely solid uh, with Netanyahu, had been talking about elections later this year. I think that that's off. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu now obviously must feel that he can do what he likes in, in Gaza. And that, that is going to be the problem now. Rafa, the refugee uh, situation. Yes, it, he's got a lot of cards in his hands again. America 
now has to face the problem of rearming Israel. They did fire away a lot of stuff. I don't want to be too nerdy about this, but if you go into Iron Dome, it isn't just Iron Dome. There's a thing called Arrow 3. A lot of it is joint American-Israeli technology, and the development of the Iron Dome defense system is really being done as much in America as it's being done in Israel. So there's going to be a big bill there. But curiously, it's a bill that Congress can unite around, and it can't unite around re rearming or resupplying, restocking, desperately needed, mm. Ukraine. Mm. Right. Why is Iran involved in this? What, who's irked Iran and how has Israel irked Iran so much? Well, it's always been there because the Ayatollahs from the beginning, 1979, is that, you know, that they are against the Zionist uh, state and they, want, they, uh, and they want to get rid of it. That is the point of support for Hamas. They've helped them, they've trained them, but they're not buddy-buddy. You have to be very careful about this, and not enough of the, of the differences have been emphasised. Um, Hamas is Arab. Hamas is Sunni. Iran is predominantly Persian and Azeri and Shia. And there are lots of dogs that didn't bark mm. in this one, because although they got involved minimally, emphasis minimally, Hezbollah, allegedly the proxy, and it can be a pretty reluctant proxy at times, of uh, Iran, hasn't done that much. Mm. Didn't go for a big assault, didn't go for a big attack on the northern cities. Mm. I mean, we hear about, we saw the Iron Dome firing over Tel Aviv and uh, uh, Jerusalem. Wasn't there an attack on the really big port, the number three city, Haifa? I don't think we've heard too much of the action. If there was, it was easily uh, battered away. There's a lot of sucking of teeth. There's a bit of finger wagging. Don't do anything crazy like attacking into Iran. Not that I, I think that they would. They would attack some bases. And I think that, you know, what we actually saw in the Damascus mm -hmm. consulate on April the 1st, I want to that ask, kind of I thing we're going to see again. Britain's involvement in this. You see yeah. the Prime Minister coming on and talking about nothing, basically. We can't confirm we've shot down a number. We can give us figures. They'll know exactly how many they, they, they shot down, if any. Um, but we've got the Shadow Defence Secretary uh, coming on the programme in about an hour's time. And, you know, Labour will talk about an increased budget for the... Uh, Defence Department here in the UK and our defence spending. What do we now need to do? We're being caught up in a number of conflicts, uh, supplying equipment, supplying backup, whatever. What are we going to have to do as regards defence spending? Well, we saw what was going on the fireworks display over Tel Aviv and, uh, uh, and Jerusalem. We've got nothing like it. Look, it's up to you, I'm doing your job for you, Emma. What you ask John Healy, it's not only thinking about defence, which they realise we've got to because the cupboard is very bare and we've got all kinds of exotic uh, coming over the horizon threats. Cyber, particularly space, which is satellites, uh, supply lines, that's what the Red Sea has given. But what I think is so worrying for me, and I can say that my age, um, is that it's they need to think about how they think about defence. Mm. It's not tanks and guns. We're not going to have a big army of 150,000 again. Actually, we don't need yeah. one. And that's the, that kind of innovative thinking that really has to be encouraged. Because the kind of stuff that we saw o over Israel, it'll all be out of date within yeah. two years. You're going to need to renovate defence systems, be flexible, to be see the enemy for what it is. And it's not going to come in very obvious yeah. forms at times. It won't come from enemy states necessarily. They will be malign actors, but there are lots well, of others out there. Up the spending. Well, That's right. And I just wanted to ask you on that. I mean, there'll be people listening and watching this this morning. You'll have someone in Sheffield, someone in Exeter going, right, what I hear Robert Fox this morning saying is this going to cost me a lot of money, what's happening, and this is an escalation in the Middle East. Are there any other implications for us in this country? I mean, if you look at the papers, some of them saying we're on the brink of well War III. You know, how worried should people be this Monday morning? Well, I think that, 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 that that's a bit of lame thinking again, if you say World War III, because it, it, we are in a global contest. Of that, there is no doubt about it. And you have to see, you know, who's acting, who's not, who's really watching and who's not speaking. Sorry, that's not blah de blah de blah. What is China doing in, in all this? Absolutely critical to the whole Iran, Middle East, Gulf the story. The, you know, that they've called for calm because um, uh, the Iranians, before all this, 
seized a ship in the Straits of Hormuz? And who relies almost more than anybody else on gas and energy coming out of the, and oil, coming out of the Straits of Hormuz, that is, from the Gulf? China. And this is where the moving parts are very important, how Britain operates, how it's going to think about it. I'm afraid to say on capital equipment, uh, they will probably have to borrow on that, because I think there are one, the, 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 there's, there's all sorts of problems with the defence budget. By the way, the defence budget isn't as fancy as it looks. We go blah, 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 2.1, 2.3% of GDP. Well, a lot of that goes on pensions, welfare. Uh, it's just about allowed under the rules, but it doesn't mean to say we're spending 2% of, of GDP on, mm, on defence. It, but it's innovation thinking, but also with the social offer, it's getting people in. We're not getting the recruits at the moment. Young people are not joining to the degree that we need. All three armed services are losing more than they're recruiting each year. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're watching or listening at yeah. home, uh, maybe you are ex-forces uh, yourself. Um, why is that? Why are the defence services not attractive at all? I mean, I think I know the answer for that because you'll get killed, basically. But um, uh, are they paying? It's a point one percent risk, <laughs> it's a, it's a one. I think it's about a point one percent risk, yeah. mm. but it, it is a risk, and yes. that's in the contract. Yeah. You're dead right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> GBnews.com forward slash your say have your say because Robert's going to be back again in an hour's time, yes. and we'll put your points and your observations to. Mm. Yeah, thank moment, you, Robert. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Uh, let's turn our attention to the Rwanda bill, shall we? The trouble bill back in the Commons today as Parliament resumes after the Easter break. MPs are set to consider amendments today from the House of Lords. Now, this comes after Victoria Atkins, the Health Secretary, suggested the Home Office was ready to go in implementing the scheme and flights could take off, her words, within weeks. Well, let's get the thoughts of political correspondent Catherine Forster. I mean, I hate to say it, but we've heard it all before, haven't we, Catherine? Yes, good morning, Eamon and Isabel. Well, we have heard it all before, and it was two years ago yesterday that the then Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, first announced this scheme. They could never have imagined that two years on, not a single migrant would have been sent to Rwanda. But that may be about to change and change in the coming weeks. The government is hopeful of getting people on flights at long last by early June. Now, Parliament is back from recess today. They've been off for well over two and a half weeks. Um, there will be votes today um, this evening in the House of Commons on the amendments that the Lords put forward. Uh, I imagine the government will attempt to uh, ditch all of those. It will then go back to the House of Lords for them to consider tomorrow. Uh, it's likely that at some point this week uh, the Lords will basically drop its opposition because ultimately it is a revising chamber, but it is not there to block government legislation. So the government is hopeful... Uh, of this bill getting royal assent soon and then uh, obviously bits to sort out but thinking they can get people on flights. One sticking point uh, I should mention, apart from the fact that uh, there could well be further legal challenges, is they don't seem to have yet... Um, worked out exactly what airline or what planes are going to take these uh, people to Rwanda because a number of commercial airlines have said, no, thank you very much. They don't really want to be associated with it. They think it's not good for their uh, reputation, including Rwandan airlines themselves. Um, I think it's quite likely that uh, the RAF may be prevailed upon. So we don't know yet how they're going to get there. But the government, yes, hopeful that this very, very long saga um, will finally result in people to Rwanda soon. Of course, the number's likely to be quite low in the beginning. And um, one other point, the T Times are reporting today, the government is looking very seriously at four other countries they'd like to potentially send channel migrants to. Those are Armenia, Ivory Coast, Costa Rica and Botswana. Um, negotiations with those countries have currently stalled until they see the Rwandan scheme up and running, but that's something that might be revisited.
Thank you, Thank Catherine. You. Thank you very much indeed. In other news, the final victim of the stabbing attack at a Sydney shopping centre has been named as a Chinese student. Police have said they will be investigating whether the Sydney shopping centre attacker intentionally targeted women after five of the six killed were women. More than 250 survivors of the Manchester Arena bombing are taking legal action against MI5. 22 people died in the explosion back in May 2017 and hundreds more were injured. Lawyers representing injured survivors confirmed they've submitted a group claim after an inquiry found the bombing might have been prevented if MI5 had acted on intelligence received in the months before the attack. Liverpool is to fall silent later today, 35 years on from the Hillsborough disaster. 97 men, women and children died in the tragedy at the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. Today at 3.06 p.m., the time the match was stopped, a minute's silence will be observed in exchange. Flags behind Liverpool Town Hall. Right, we're taking our attention across the pond to New York now. The first of four criminal trials involving Donald Trump is taking place starting today. OK, the former president, he faces charges related to what is termed hush money uh, made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. This was in 2016. The case marks the first criminal trial of a US ex-president as he continues his campaign uh, to be Republican nominee for... President. Joining us now, former Nevada Republican Party chairwoman Amy Tarkanian. Amy, good morning to you. Good morning. Amy, you used to be a big Trump supporter. Why, why are you no longer? This is true, and it's very uh, depressing, quite honestly, uh, that he is our nom nominee after uh, a string of indictments have followed President Trump. And also the fact, I think the final straw for me was the January 6th event where he basically sat by and watched for several hours while his followers, his devoted followers, um, basically stormed the Capitol and, and caused destruction. And so I, I think that he continues to surround himself with grifters. He's made some very poor decisions and uh, it doesn't seem that he has learned from his mistakes. Amy, he's fought hard to try and uh, push this trial as far down the road as possible. Originally, I think it was tabled to start around Super Tuesday. He managed to move that on. Who knows if that might have had different uh, impacts for him on Super Tuesday when he was really, really successful. Um, but he's facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records, all linked to this one hush, punny, hush payment story with Stormy um, Daniels. Just explain to us how this has led to all these falsifying accounts um, allegations and how conservative Americans like yourself will feel seeing a former president facing such salacious charges? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I think more reasonable, rational Republicans um, are, are pretty upset, uh, once again, that he is our nominee. And uh, those who are considered Trump purists um, have pretty much put all of this into the category of political persecution, no matter how bad it may be. And so I think that this criminal case is going to be quite an eye opener. And even though it's listed as a class E uh, felony, which means it's the lowest level possible for New York state law, he could still see anywhere from uh, probation up to four years in prison. Um, however, I, I don't actually see that happening since this would be his, his first um, you know, run with the law, so to speak. Um, but you have somebody who, Michael Cohen, who used to work for President Trump, actually obtained a line of credit on his home before the election to pay this alleged non-disclosure um, hush money, $130,000 to Stormy Daniels. Um, actually, when this came out, it was also around the same time as the Access Hollywood tapes were released, where he was viewed as saying some pretty um, repulsive comments um, about how he would handle women. And so he didn't want to be viewed as somebody who was extremely inappropriate leading right up to the election. And so that's why they're allegedly saying this took place at that time. Now, there's also two others that he's also having to deal with. There's a doorman that was paid $30,000 allegedly um, for claiming that Trump 
had a child out of wedlock. And then there's a former Playboy model, uh, Karen Dougal, who was also paid $150,000 to remain quiet. So the, the problem here is that Michael Cohen is saying that he has a recorded conversation with the former president discussing the hush money. And then also the fact that I, how I just mentioned, he obtained a line of credit on his home. So that's, that's a hard copy um, of evidence. And then uh, we'll see too, the fact that they're saying that there were phony invoices made um, claiming that they were legal fees and that it, they were actually recorded but, in but, his ledger. Amy, Amy, um, uh, Amy however, however ghastly all of this sounds, <laughs> I, I, put it, I put it to you, I use the word ghastly. If this yeah. were a British politician, career over, right? We wouldn't even, that, that would right. be the end of that. Um, are you overly shocked by this? Are you outraged by this? Does this turn you off Trump completely? I mean, if you're a, yes. a neutral vo voter uh, at this stage, because he's in court so often on so many things, I think it just goes over people's heads now. Sure, you almost have become desensitized as an American voter, um, which, which is also not okay because these are some serious allegations. And so if you're talking about a former president who, you know, as we all know, uh, there are very powerful uh, people who have NDA signed all the time and, and most likely probably do pay people off to remain quiet when they're being inappropriate. Um, but this is a situation where we're talking about uh, documents, fake documents that were put uh, as far as putting into the accounting records of the former president's business. And so then we also have Trump's checks reimbursing uh, Michael Cohen right after the election. So th this, this stinks to high heaven. And for someone such as myself, as you say, this is ghastly. Um, I feel like I am on a deserted island. I, I, I do not approve of President Biden. I do not approve of former President Donald Trump. Um, there are third party options, but historically they don't do well. Good luck to you, Amy, finding a winner from, <laughs> Thank you. from that law. Thank you. It's going to be a fascinating much. six weeks. He's going to be in court every day for yeah. that. And all the previous court appearances, it's been, you know, a few hours here or there. So will this cut through? Will this first uh, criminal is Amy trial still there? Uh, no. be the one? Who knows? Um, but will all eyes before. will be on what happens there? What, what, what I was going to ask Amy is, how come he's got such a God Squad following? I, come I don't understand that. I this. don't understand that. I really don't. And that's been an ongoing question of mine. I mean, it started when it was grabbing women by the genitalia. How did the church God-fearing crowd not find that offensive? Absolutely mystifies me. Um, but it just escalates there with all, all of the sort of porn star salaciousness. But we shall hear all those details during this trial over the next few weeks. So strap yourself in ready for that. minutes past six o'clock. Very good to have you on board. Here's your weather update. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So a very blustery and showery start to the day this morning with brisk northwesterly winds. That will help clear a band of rain across southern and eastern parts out towards the southeast through the rest of the morning. And then we will start to see some sunshine developing as we head in towards this afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and these could turn quite heavy in places, particularly across northern parts of England and parts of Scotland, where we could see some sleet and snow over the hills. With that brisk northwesterly breeze, temperatures struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 degrees in the south and struggling to reach into the double figures further north, but it will definitely be feeling colder than that with the wind. Through Monday evening, showers do continue to push their way southwards overnight and these could turn heavy in places, perhaps some localised flooding, but it will gradually start to turn a little drier as we go through into the early hours of Tuesday morning, leaving plenty of clear skies around and the winds gradually starting to ease as well, but still a chilly night under those clear skies. Temperatures around 5 or 6 degrees in the north, perhaps a touch lower in some rural spots.
Tuesday does start a much drier day, though. Plenty of sunshine as we head through the morning. There will still be a few showers around, particularly across eastern coasts of England and across parts of Wales and Northern Ireland, too, and perhaps the odd one or two bubbling up across southeastern parts. But there will still be plenty of sunshine across northern parts of England. Not quite as windy as Monday and temperatures are still a touch below average, around 12 or 13, maybe 14 degrees in the south and around 10, 11 in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Now we run the Great British Giveaway Competition and you may say, who wins these things? Well, we're going to say congratulations to Victoria from Hertfordshire. Yeah, she won our spring giveaway and what a giveaway that was. We called her last week to let her, let her know the good news. Here's how she reacted. So, Victoria, I've got some really good news for you. You're the winner of the Great British Giveaway. Oh, my God, are you joking? You've won £12,345. Yeah. You've won £500 to spend in the store of your choice. Oh, my God. You've won a pizza oven, a games console, and you've also won a smart speaker. Oh, my God. This is amazing. What, what do you think you might spend the money on? Oh, we're going to Disney. It's not paid for yet. So this will go for it. Thank you. See, off to Disney. You see, this is where fairy tales come true, right here on GB News. Very good. Um, oh, I'm very happy for her. And my goodness me, if you missed out on that one, don't worry. We've got another giveaway for you. OK, it is your chance to win a Greek cruise, travel goodies, £10,000 tax-free. Here's what you've got to do. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Well, still to come this morning, we're going to be talking about a branch of the Royal Society of St George. Why yeah. is that? Well, it's disbanding after discovering it can't attract new members. Outraged you might be. You'll have all the details in just a moment. St George as in patron saint of yes. England, St George. Yes, April 23rd, St George. OK, talk about that after this. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. There was a, a, a kind of a Mediterranean side to that as well, because my mother came from that side, you know, a, a big family. And I think there is that sense of community where family is kind of key. And I think that's really kind of what we sort of try and continue, really. I mean, certainly with children and stuff like that, you know, the Sunday lunches were always, you know, the big thing. Yeah, <laughs> really. if you go down the old camp road today. Very different. Very different, yeah. And that was quite some time ago as well, because we were very close to where the Tom Beckett was. Yeah, uh, I know. Uh, I know, the boxing and, um, upstairs and all yeah, the rest of it. Yep, yep, yep. And, um, and I did go down there not so long ago, actually, and it really is very, very different. I mean, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I think we have a different view of things. In Most sense. people in London, Nicky, don't even know the names of the next-door neighbours. No, true. We've that's completely true. lost that sense of community that you grew up with, yeah. that you knew. I think it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I have to say sometimes I'm a bit guilty of it where I am now as well. You live in big houses, and yeah, I yeah. do see my neighbours, but, you know, it's not quite the same as it was back. Now, I guess from that background, you're a teenager, you want to become a hairdresser. Yeah, that's, That must that, have been that, quite a difficult call. Yeah, that one was a really good, a really good call. My dad went, oh, God, what? I mean, it was just very funny. And, and, and certainly from the point of view of, you know, this was the early 70s, and yeah. so it wasn't really that kind of... The choice of most that most people would do. No, but you did. But why? I don't know. Actually, I mean, I actually, I went to a grammar school, and um, I didn't do as well in the final um, uh, exams, and I was kind of forced into sort of leaving. And you suddenly go, Ooh, 
no idea what to do here, really. Yeah. But the idea of doing something in fashion. And, you know, I really kind of... I, I know that I was given some really good advice, actually, by somebody that said, just start at the bottom. Don't necessarily go to, you know, college or whatever. Not, there may not be anything wrong with those, but just start at the bottom. Go to the best place you can and start sweeping the floor. So, if you're English, how patriotic are you? Because... A branch of the Royal Society of St George is disbanding after discovering it can't attract new members. So, not very patriotic, it seems. So, the president of the Leicestershire Society says changing values and demographics in the area are making it too difficult for that particular society to carry on. It is an international society. Uh, it says it's non-political and it promotes Englishness while celebrating the country's patron saint. Well, our East Midlands reporter, Will Hollis, can tell you all in this GB News exclusive. In every corner of the world, people celebrate English tradition and values as members of the Royal Society of St George. Yet here in England, branches are closing as membership dwindles. I feel that in this country, St George is all but dead and buried. Until recently, Stephen Warden from Wigston was president of the Leicestershire branch. Despite spending £1,500 of his own money advertising, he couldn't find enough members to keep it running. I did everything humanly possible to get new members into the branch from the local environment, but they were just not interested in joining. He thinks changing demographics and declining interest in the society's values contributed to disappearing membership. But he also blames political leadership at national and local levels. Stephen claims his proposal for a St George's Day parade was repeatedly rejected by Leicester City Council over 10 years. A celebration is planned for St George's Day, but like most cities and towns, no parade will pass through the streets. A Leicester City Council spokesperson said, Leicester's annual celebrations of St George's Day have been organised and funded by the City Council for many decades and they remain an important part of the city's festival calendar. Some in Leicester say they would like to see more done to celebrate England's patron saint. I think it's a sign of patriotism. I think it helps the country. We celebrate a lot of religious festivals here. People forget, I think, uh, what is important to England. Maybe it's been sort of... Um, jumped onto with the wrong crowd, but I think nowadays it's just completely different. The Royal Society of St George has 5,000 members worldwide. It's non-political, open to all faiths and backgrounds, but is fiercely patriotic, promoting Englishness and values like free speech and tolerance. Nick Dutt is the Society's chairman. Patriotism has been linked to nationalism which are two very different things. We're a patriotic society. If you say in Scotland and Ireland, Wales, you're a, pa you're a patriot, no one thinks an eye. In England, people should take a step back. And that is a challenge, and it's how we try and change that. Back in Wigston, St George's Cross flies above Stephen's home. It makes me feel good, because I know at least I've not forgotten St George, if everybody else has. Even though his branch is gone, he's still a member of the society. He can't turn his back on St George. Will Hollis, GB News in Leicester. Well, oh dear. Now, you actually went to a St George's school. I did. I, my school was St George's, yeah. And, and, and were you taught to be proud about the, the patron saint of England? I don't remember any particular emphasis on it. Does your son remember it? Because he went to the same school. Yeah. Um, well, he's, he's a good Georgian or whatever. Oh, OG, old Georgian. Yes. And St George, as it turns out, as I was just uh, telling uh, the guys around me here, uh, is not actually English. He was a commander in the Roman army and he was from Turkey. There you go. He was Turkish. So there, there we go. We claim him, though, as our own. But you see, the interesting thing, you, you, you don't... England, England is pathetic at claiming its... Pe it is. I mean, I speak Excuse as an me. Irishman. Excuse I speak... me, we have our royal family. They are the absolute... Well, I'm talking so... about your patron saint. OK, fine, you have but no, we celebrate you have absolutely... our English aristocrats. You don't care about who your patron saint is, <laughs> whereas certainly, and I'm not speaking for the Welsh or the Scottish, who I think are very patriotic as well, but the Irish, I mean, come St Patrick's Day, 
everybody wants to be Irish. So why does why does the same not yeah. apply to England? I mean, I'm very happy to be English on St George's Day. Get a day off. Well, why don't you get a day off? Why isn't it a national holiday in England? Oh, that's a good point. That's a very yeah. good point. Mm. Well, it's exactly as they described in the in the report there that people have conflated nationalism with patriotism and people are afraid of being seen as nationalists so they sort of shy away from celebrating their patron saint. Let us know your thoughts mm. on all of that. Thoughts on what happened in the sport over the weekend. We go to Mr Paul Coit. Good morning, Mr Welcome Coit. Back. Good morning. Thank you very much. So Patrick was a Frenchman though, wasn't he? Oh, was stupid. That... Yeah, he, he was. He was... Oh, <laughs> um, no, even worse, he's Dutch. That would really wind, can you, wind the Can he drive out of Ireland? <laughs> Sorry? What did he drive out of Ireland? Oh. <sighs> Me. <laughs> I see. Is that what it was? You well, they were when they snakes and things. You know, we have, yeah, we have no snakes. There were snakes, right? Yeah, snakes. We have no snakes. So there were no snakes. There are no snakes. There's no snakes. Didn't it's slay a, a dragon, snakes. though, did he? Quite a few snakes around here, you know. <laughs> <Really>. Stop it. <laughs> Obviously not in this room. Uh, did, right, did you stay up and watch the Masters last yeah, night? Yeah, I did. I did. That's why I've been a little bit. Uh, Scotty Scheffler. Because uh, I remember we, we spoke about Scotty Scheffler, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago. World number one, second green jacket, and Pantone 342. Do you know what that is? Nope. Pantone 342 is the colour of the green jacket Ooh. that he's won at the Augusta Masters. There is Scotty there. In I th what would you say? What colour would you say that was? Peach. That looks peach to me. A little, with a little peach there, which would go very well with the green jacket. There he is celebrating the win. Um, so he's done extremely well. Second win, a 68 there in the final round. Now there's beard, large bearded young man handing green jacket over to another large, large bearded, bearded green man. Mm -hmm. jacket man, and that's John Rahm. Mm -hmm. John Rahm in the pink tie, who was the winner last year, who's since gone to live golf and has had a disaster since he's there, and he was awful at the Masters. So but he's very rich. <laughs> he's extremely rich. Yeah. So I wonder whether... Because people are saying, oh, I wonder whether John Rahm regrets the fact that he went to... I, probably not. Yeah, I'll tell you which is interesting, though. This is an interesting fact, is that the top three that were in the Masters that won the Masters last year, and that is... So that was John Rahm, who won it, uh, and also Brooks Kepka and Phil Mickelson. Now, tell me if you think this is a good fact, who all went to live... If you combine their scores, that is plus 54 over par, and 54 is LIV, which is the Roman numerals. Oh. L-I-V. I don't understand a word you said. LIV oh is God. named oh. after... New is in, is live, LIV Golf, which is the Saudi Arabian back golf I know chart. what that is. Yeah. Well, LIV, L-I-V, it's actually Roman numerals for oh, 54. and that adds up to 54. And the amount over par, you the three of those were, out. was 50. Well, I'm ready Was that to you? I mean, you it wasn't. It? I'm not that smart, that but up. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was excellent. Um, but Tiger Woods did not have such a good day. I don't really care about Tiger Woods. But Do you know why? No, but why I care don't about, you care about Tiger Woods? Because I care about Rory McIlroy. Tiger Woods is never going to win anything. Tiger, Rory McIlroy, wouldn't he? This Rory, 20 seconds. like 20 seconds. I know, second. it's awful. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, what is this? Is 16th attempt or something? And, uh, just Welshman really... Rory McIlroy. <laughs> mm. So, no, it, well, the thing is, it's, this is the one he's never won, yeah. is the Masters, mm -hmm. and whether he's going to. And then, but Tiger did play, I know you're not bothered, but he was actually came last. Well, Although he did well, qualify, came why last. Why does this surprise anybody? He's never going to win a major title again. But he's the greatest there's ever been. But he's now, he yeah. is saying, great, I will continue. Was. He was, but that's the whole point, you're mm -hmm. right, is that it was... It's everything's in the past. And like when we talk about Andy Murray and we talk about great sportsmen, you've got to know... When to go. When to call it quits. As the gambler said, you've got to know when to hold them, you've got to know when to fold them, yeah. you've got to know when to walk away and... I just can't get the tune, nowhere. but I know the song. No yes, when right. to hold them, no when... It's Kenny Rogers, mm -hmm. yeah, who's yeah, also a very good poor, song. poor good golfer. Song. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> anyway, but that was the Masters. All came to an end yesterday, very good. Well, has it come for an end for uh, oh, Liverpool yes. or indeed Arsenal in I the know. Premier League? Yeah, yeah, so Liverpool lose at home to Crystal Palace. So Jurgen Klopp, final year... Going to win this, going to win that. Well, it's looking very wobbly now. A Terrible week. result in the week. Mm. Um, and so that was against Atalanta, where they lost 3-0. So Liverpool are, are, are wobbling. And now Arsenal. Um, yeah. So it's all that... Especially they Arsenal lost their lose at home. You know, it's, um, it's a big... Big defeat at home at well, Aston Villa. Aston Villa. Aston Villa, too. Now, Aston Villa were terrific yesterday, but mm. Arsenal weren't. And... Really, the big winners over the weekend has been Manchester City. Mm -hmm. So they beat Luton. So they're looking at now the, on the top. And whether Arsenal are actually going to recover from this, I don't know. So have they got the bottle to carry on? We'll have to mm -hmm. see. Same thing goes for Rangers, though, in the in in Scotland. Scotland. 
they lost 3 2 to Ross County. Ross County have never beaten Rangers before. Yeah. So now Rangers are in this uh, fight against Celtic, and now it looks like they're all getting wobbly. Everybody's yeah. wobbling left, right, and centre. Yeah. It's a wobbly, yeah. it was a wobbly so, day yesterday. Uh, wobbly day. Including Bayern Munich. Well, yeah, they're wobbly. Well, they're, they're done for now because Bayer Leverkusen. Now, Bayer Leverkusen who they were calling by Neverkusen because they would never, they've never won the Bundesliga title in 120 years. Never all... Oh, they came close, but this year they have been unbelievable. And they beat Werder Bremen. I know we don't talk about German football much, but the thing is, it's by Leverkusen was so good under Xabi Alonso, the first that they have won the Bundesliga, and it's the first time that Bayern Munich haven't won it in about 12 years. And, of course, Harry Kane has gone over to Bayern Munich because they're thinking he's going to win something. So the only chance he's now got they've got to play Arsenal this week and uh, and that's going to be in Germany to get through to the next round of the Champions League. So well, it all fits uh, in like a jigsaw. Uh, Bayern Munich, I'll predict they will be... They'll have a new manager next year. Mm. And I think the existing manager, Tuchel, you'll see him in the English Premier League. You game. think he'll be back? Oh, yeah. Oh, do you? And I can think of a club that <laughs> would be interested in him as well. You wouldn't, would you? I'm just do telling you. Do you think United I, I would th take Tuchel? I do. Really? Yeah. So how long do we think that Eric Ten Hag's got left in? I'm just saying, I don't know what the future Eric Ten Hag <laughs> this, is, right. but I don't think that fans would cry one way or the other if there was a change. No, I think you're probably right. Mm. But the other thing, one more very quick one, and this is Isabel, now there's going to be a rivalry here because the women's FA Cup final uh, has been decided. Manchester United beat Chelsea yesterday, Spurs beat Leicester. Don't ask it's me whose Tottenham, side I'm going to choose. It's a Spurs v Manchester oh, United no. final in May, so I'd like, I think Spurs will be for the it's team. It's a day out for him and me. It is, yeah. Oh, well, I you guys so. enjoy it. I'll leave you to it. They'll I'm not going to involved. They'll probably get us to present the cup. I think they probably That's will. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll come for the entertainment. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. See you later, alligator. Uh, still to come, we'll be going through the front pages and the biggest stories of the day. Don Neeson, Chris Akabusi here on Breakfast on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In Suffolk, the A14 is closed in both directions between junctions 43 and 44 at Bury St Edmunds after an accident with delays as you divert. On the M25 in Essex, the anti-clockwise exit at junction 30 for the A13 is closed because of an accident with delays as you divert there. In London, the A5 is closed in both directions underneath Staples Corner where there's an accident on the roundabout. The A5 and the North Circular are both open over the roundabout. The buses are having to divert. Now, on the trains, there are delays of up to half an hour with some cancelled trains between Clapham Junction and Victoria Station in London because of a points failure. And the M487 bridge is closed each way between England and Wales because of strong winds. Diversions are by the M4 over the Prince of Wales Bridge. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Nigel Farage, and this is GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Thanks very much indeed for your comments coming in on all sorts of things we've been talking about mm. today. Uh, the uh, Iranian attack on Israel over the weekend, seeing the amount of missiles. This is from John. Rockets and drones, 99% never got through the dome. Surely Israel should call it a day because we shouldn't have to keep putting our RAF pilots in the skies and at risk of being shot down. 
Oh, look, somebody's questioning whether or not St George came from Turkey. Apparently, he was Greek under the Roman Empire. He wasn't. He was Roman. Mm. And he was uh, from Turkey. And, um, right, the reason the armed forces don't get recruits, says Andrew, is they want everything given to them, but they don't want to fight for it. They need to be reminded their freedom was never free. We've got Don Neeson and we've got Chris Akabusi now to talk about such things. So, Chris, uh, we were talking about uh, the defence editor of the um, the, uh, Evening Standard, and uh, he was basically saying recruitment is a big problem for our armed forces. Why is that, Chris? And, and you speak as an ex-soldier yourself. Yeah. So, um, I joined the Army in 1975, and uh, a lot of the people that joined the Army uh, in, in the junior sort of ranks are people from impoverished backgrounds. I, from, I was a kid from care. Uh, I think... When I was a young man, it was quite clear that you had to go and get a job. Uh, and, and for me, the safest job was in the army. I know it sounds ridiculous because the army is a war fighting machine, but it was the safest job. Safest job. I was guaranteed I was going to get pay, food, clothes, etc. I think today there is a sense for the young people that there are many, many options. For example, the state will look after you if you can't look after yourself. Was that not the case in '75? Certainly didn't have the sense. Yeah. The sense was you had to go to work. You know, everyone was going to go to work, and you know, you, there was work out there. Mm. So I, I, do, I do think that's the benefit culture. And I'm, you know, I'm not having to go at anybody, but I do think the sense that the state will take care of you if you don't go to work help people not go. Do you think it's so much the welfare state as more the sort of Instagram generation where everyone just wants to be an influencer or, or a celebrity? I, I think, yeah, I mean, um, I mean, sort of like, you know, the days when, you know, boys wanted builders or plumbers are long rolling gone. Rolling your sleeves up. Yeah, so it's, appealing. It, it is. It's everyone, as you say, wants to be an influencer now. And I think Chris is right on the fact that we are now encouraged to blame everybody else for something that goes wrong. I mean, it's like, I think I don't think COVID helped with that, the fact that it was the government's fault, the government were micromanaging our lives, and now it's like, you know, everything I do, there's someone else to blame for it. It's about taking personal responsibility, and I think when you joined up, Chris, certainly from, as you say, a working-class background, um, you, you, you did that. Mm. Now you think, no, hold on a minute, someone's got to come and look after me, I'm not going to look after myself. Mm. As you say, not not having a go at anyone in particular, but mm. I think there is that mindset that's changed enormously from when, from when you were younger. I was also thinking, just as you were talking, actually, what, that when I joined the Army as well, OK, Northern Ireland was, 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 a, was a thing, but mm. we, we weren't at war, obviously. It was a, a security operation. Whereas I think over the last sort of 30 years, there's been this proliferation of the United Kingdom being involved in wars, like Iraq, yeah. Afghanistan. You know, Soldiers' Day have got a whole raft of medals. Mm. In our day, you didn't have those sort of medals. So I think that now young people actually realise you can go and die. Yeah. You know, you are seeing soldiers come back maimed. And another one, another one, just is coming to me. Another thing is, young people today, when you, you see your, your veterans on the streets, sleeping rough. <sighs> so you go out to war, you think you're protecting the country, but no one's there to protect you afterwards. So, I mean, these are all these things that young people got to deal with yeah. that I didn't have to deal with in my Compared day. Compared to our veterans who looked after in America. Where they have, you know, Veterans Day and everything, and they're not, you know, they're not forced to. Or no, they, there are cases, but in this country, that we just don't respect people that have mm-hmm. served. Mm. Um, what happened, Chris? To, well, that knifer in Sydney over the weekend was he killed? Mm. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, was killed by the policewoman. Thank goodness for that. Yeah. Taken um, out straight away. Right. So tell me about these Sydney stabbings and this madman. Well, so a lot has been made this morning the fact that the one chap that died was a security officer. The five women, well, five others were women. Mm. Um, and I just, reading this bit in the, in the um, eye, I think this is, excuse me, um, I didn't realize this guy was an escort. He had advertised himself online as a male escort and tried to join several groups. So the wonder is whether there was a misogynistic bent with this chap. Sorry, when you say an escort, like as in a ladies' man. A male escort. Yeah, yeah, escort, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, rather than, yeah. So he will take out women, uh, well, who knows what he does, but um, he had as, a, as an escort. But whether there was some sort of vendetta against women or was he scared of the blokes? Because he, he, tried to, he tried to kill women and he was successful mm. to fire women and one guy is a, is a security guy who yeah, uh, yeah. appended him in some sort of way. Mm. So, obviously a tragedy. Westfield Shopping Centre, we've got them here in the United yeah. Kingdom. Going shopping is a very natural thing. 
I think the one thing that I... I don't know if the, what, like's not the right word, but saving grace, it, it wasn't a terrorist attack. It, it, it yeah. wasn't like a Muslim against yeah. Westerners. It was just a mad, deranged person yeah. versus his personal vendetta. But, but you know the, the fascinating thing? I was watching CCTV footage of it, and he walks past certain people. Mm. So he could have walked past you, had the knife in his hand. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what determined whether he stabbed someone or didn't stab I them? I think it was your sex, to be honest with you. He walked past lots of men, and there were men having a go. There was one very brave man standing at the top of a travelator, an escalator, mm -hmm. who was, you know, literally armed with it, it looked like a cone, like a cleaning cone. And he, he ran away from him. But then, as, as Chris has pointed out, he killed five women. Yeah. And he, he stabbed a mother pushing her baby in a pram. Yeah. And, uh, and, and stabbed I, a child. He, and stabbed the child, and we think, thankfully, the child is recovering in hospital. But, I mean, you know, that, that poor lady lost yeah. her life. That's and one of the last things she did aunt. was protect her child by yes. handing the baby oh, no. over to no. people nearby to yeah. save the child, which they did. So many heroes. I mean, the one... I mean, the, the, the one... If you can take any positives from this horrific story is the fact how people pulled together, how people helped one another. Heroes stepping into Heroes, the absolutely. Way. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but talking as, as a woman, Isabel, and as a feminist, I love the fact that this piece of filth was taken up by a woman. So do I, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, especially since you targeting said it, women. Well yeah. done, her. I thought mm -hmm. the same. Um, Rwanda Bill, Dawn, uh, back in Parliament today. Oh, um, oh, are they talking in absolute cloud cuckoo land that they think flights will take off within weeks? I mean, even if this bill gets royal assent, which airline is going to carry out well, these this flights? Is That's problem. an irrelevant argument actually you know I was listening to this today you simply just hire you charter aircraft yeah, you but charter I mean, no one wants to do oh, a private, no, a aircraft, private yeah, aircraft I mean I can't see how you would book on board British Airways mm. or EasyJet or whatever you mm. just hire an airline they've gone to such expense already mm. Why not? Just well, this is, this is the problem, I and mean, this is one of the stories about this. Obviously, it's a, it's a game of ping-pong. It has been between the House of Lords and the House of Commons, and the laws keep tweaking it, it goes back to the Commons, and the Commons uh, are trying to get it pushed through, and whether it actually ever happened. And we do know that Rishi Sunak, when he was Chancellor, didn't even think it was a goer in the first place. Mm. Um, but this other story in The Telegraph today is that Rwanda scheme could cost £5 billion pounds over the next five years. It's £150,000 per asylum seeker. I mean, it's, it's just an insane amount of money. But, you know, as far as the airline story is concerned, you know, the RAF, well, we don't have enough planes. We're potentially on the brink of God knows what war. Um, the RAF has said, we, if we wanted to do it, which we particularly don't, we couldn't do it. And as you say, how much more is it going to cost, Eamon, if we have to charter airlines? I pay the money to persuade them to do it, because not many airlines want to be associated with it, to take them out there. Mm. It's Costing an utter fortune, and not one single person but has been sent out there. The political cost is immense. Oh. Uh, no, it's immense if they get this underway. But will it? It's, will it's, it change? How immense? Will it change well, their fortunes? I this think. is what I think. I mean, it's it it's makes being people think that the government means business mm. on this. Well, I think that's why they're going for it. I mm. think really, I don't think Rishi Sunak believes it, it'll work. Mm. But I, I think he has to go for something so he can turn around and say, "Look, I've sorted out the migration problem," and everyone's going. No, you haven't, mate. And what about the cost of living? What about the NHS? What about all the stuff that we really care for if you knock on people's doors and saying, what are you really worried about today? Mm. Um, the next two stories are linked. Um, Chris, this is a fascinating interview with Salman Rushdie uh, in The Telegraph, an exclusive for them. He's talking about returning to London after spending 24 years in New York because he can't bear the thought of another Trump presidency. And he also talks about his premonition, dreaming about being attacked before he was so horrendously t attacked on stage and lost an eye. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's the, the, the major point, really. What, you know, what, the headline says Trump, but actually when you get into it, it is actually the fact that... He had this premonition, um, thought about cancelling, but thought it was an irrational thought, therefore stayed, then got uh, this awful attack where he nearly lost his eye. In the pool of his blood, he said his ultimate sense wasn't of fear, but of loneliness. No. That he was there dying on the, on the paper with no, none of his family there. Mm. Uh, and... and, and, and this comes 33 years after the fatwa against him because of the um, satanic verses. And so I, I sense the idea... Now, having lived in America for the last 24 years, mm. he actually realises North, East, South, West, home is best. You know, he's advancing in, in, in years. I'm not saying he's an old, old man, but he's advancing in years. And he's decided, actually, 
I think I might want to go back home. And, and, and I get that. I get that sense that actually you are born alone and you are di you, we do die alone, but you don't need to live alone. And there's this sense when you come back to your own country, you know the customs, the cultures, the values, the people, and a sense that, yeah, what, he, what Mr Trump um, um, typifies is not what he wants. So he's thinking about coming back home. Mm. So I do get that, uh, and I thought that sense of... Dying alone. He, did, he didn't seem to say that he, he feared his death, but that loneliness. I think um, there have been a few interesting death-related stories, not to get a bit morbid at this time Happy of Happy Monday morning! <laughs> there, well, there was a story yesterday I was reading about um, Caroline Lucas, the first Green MP, mm. who said she's quitting Parliament to become a death doula, which is oh, yeah. essentially a great. midwife for yeah. people dying. Yeah, great. She lost her parents last year and she said that British people just can't talk about death. Great, yeah. It stopped me in my tracks. I never thought about a death doula. Yeah, it's fabulous. Um, There's a woman I called Catherine... I like the thought of someone being... So you don't have that loneliness. Yeah, there's a woman called Catherine Maddox, um, who wrote a phenomenal book. She herself is uh, the death doula, Pike Salons, and, she, and she's spot on. You know, what we used to see, when I say we, I wasn't born then, but in, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, grandma, great grandma died at home. We, mm. And we saw death daily, yeah. and we grew up with death. But we've got quite asinine, and, 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 and we've cut that out of our lives mm. in, in the sort of back end of the 20th century, 21st century. And yet, the, death is not a fight. It is part of the life experience. In fact, death is what makes life yeah. worth living yeah. uh, and embracing it. We're out of time, Chris. Sos, sos, sos. Um, but, but that <laughs> thought, I mean, I agree with you. The, the, one of the strangest things I've had to come to terms with mm. being from Ireland is English people just don't deal with death. They no, can't they deal with they can't talk no. with it. And one of the problems is it usually takes you a month to get buried in England, yeah. whereas in Ireland it's yeah. three days, mm -hmm. and I don't understand why it takes a month for anybody to die and then go down a mm. hole after that. Uh, guys, back again, 45 yeah. minutes for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're going to get a check on the forecast for you. Do you need your brolly today? Ellie Glazier will tell you. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So a very blustery and showery start to the day this morning with brisk northwesterly winds. That will help clear a band of rain across southern and eastern parts out towards the southeast through the rest of the morning. And then we will start to see some sunshine developing as we head in towards this afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and these could turn quite heavy in places, particularly across northern parts of England and parts of Scotland, where we could see some sleet and snow over the hills. With that brisk northwesterly breeze, temperatures struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 degrees in the south and struggling to reach into the double figures further north, but it will definitely be feeling colder than that with the wind. Through Monday evening, showers do continue to push their way southwards overnight and these could turn heavy in places, perhaps some localised flooding, but it will gradually start to turn a little drier as we go through into the early hours of Tuesday morning, leaving plenty of clear skies around and the winds gradually starting to ease as well, but still a chilly night under those clear skies. Temperatures around 5 or 6 degrees in the north, perhaps t a touch lower in some rural spots. Tuesday does start a much drier day, though. Plenty of sunshine as we head through the morning. There will still be a few showers around, particularly across eastern coasts of England and across parts of Wales and Northern Ireland too, and perhaps the odd one or two bubbling up across southeastern parts. But there will still be plenty of sunshine across northern parts of England. Not quite as windy as Monday, and temperatures are still a touch below average, around 12 or 13, maybe 14 degrees in the south, and around 10, 11 in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in Suffolk. The A14 is closed in both directions between junctions 43 and 44 at Bury St Edmunds after an accident involving a lorry that delays through Bury as you divert. On the M25 in Essex, the anti-clockwise exit slip roads closed at junction 30 for the A13 after an accident that delays off junction 31 as you divert from there. The M48 Seven Bridge is closed each way between England and Wales because of strong winds versions via the M4 over the Prince of Wales Bridge. Other travel services to and from the Isle of Wight are suspended between South Sea and Ryde because of poor weather conditions. And in Cornwall, the A30 is closed in both directions until 7 this morning for roadworks between the Chiverton Cross roundabout and the Carland Cross roundabout. And that's the latest.
you can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good morning. It is seven o'clock on the dot and it is Monday the 15th of April and you're very welcome. You're welcome to have you on board. This is Breakfast on GB News. Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. World leaders are calling for calm as Israel has vowed revenge following Iran's attack over the weekend. And in just half an hour, we'll be speaking to the Shadow Defence Secretary, John Healy. Rwanda's back in the headlines as the government teases the prospect of flights within weeks. Yes, it's two years since Boris Johnson first announced this scheme. MPs are back today. They'll be voting on the safety of Rwanda bill later. It's likely to get royal assent soon, and the government believes that flights will be taking off in the coming weeks. I'll bring you more shortly. The first of four criminal trials against Donald Trump is beginning today in New York. He faces charges over a hush money payment to the porn star Stormy Daniels. And our debate this morning, with more than 11 million sick notes issued last year, we'll be asking, is it time to do something about them and make them dry up? Let us know your views. And sport, well, starting with golf, Scotty Scheffler said he'd walk off the course if his wife went into labour during the Masters. She didn't, so he didn't, and he won, and he's now cradling a beautiful new green jacket. Congratulations to him. Uh, Arsenal and Liverpool have both gone a little bit wobbly with their title challenges, uh, and Eamon will be delighted to know that Emma Raducanu is back. It's been a breezy and showery start to the morning, but there will be some sunshine on offer this afternoon. Join me later for the full forecast with all the details. So it is our top story this morning. World leaders have called for calm after Israel vowed revenge against the country for drone strikes on Saturday night. Now, America has told Israel it will not participate in any retaliatory strikes and has asked Israel to show restraint. On Saturday evening, around 300 missiles were dispatched by Iran, 99% of which were brought down before entering Israel, according to their defence minister. Rishi Sunak yesterday confirmed the UK's involvement in shooting down many of those missiles. This is what he had to say. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. Uh, the defence editor of the Evening Standard, we welcome back Robert Fox on uh, this one. Robert, what about an update now that you, you get time to digest all that happened on Saturday evening and was dealt with, you know, quite simplis in a simplistic way? There's something that looks almost orchestrated about this, and this is not only my view, it's from people actually on the inside. Uh, there was a lot of signalling going on. Iran was talked to by back channels and probably quite directly by the Americans. They knew what was going to happen. And although it sounds a lot, it was 330 pieces of ordnance that were fired, drones, missiles and so on, rockets, um, it's only a tiny part of, of, what, of what they've got. It's that they've done their set-piece number 
And now we're off the script. What happens next? And I think that that's what's worrying. And the Americans are saying, don't go mad, Israel. Netanyahu himself, the Israeli leader, has been a beneficiary because he was quite bunkered. He was being attacked, we believe, even by people within his own war co coalition. He now must feel that he's got a free hand to do mm. what he wants. He will do something against I Iran. They're saying, don't do the same. Don't do what Iran's done to you, attack into Iranian territory. And I think America's been very specific about that. What will he do? I'm afraid well, assassination. How, how do you hit Iran if you don't attack their territory? They've got these bases that they support across Syria and Iraq. Right. And they've got people which we know the Israelis are very good at following. Um, so uh, watch this space. Mm. The big worry is this means that uh, Netanyahu will feel that he can do what he wants in Gaza. And Gaza is looking as if it's got no resolution again at the moment. That's one of the big minuses uh, from this. But there must be a lot of sucking of teeth going on, uh, particularly in Whitehall and in the Défense, in the uh, administration of defence and in the Elysee Palace in France okay. through critical allies. Tell me this, Robert, why was it with Ukraine we were told we absolutely couldn't use even our aircrafts or even our pilots in any form to defend Ukraine and yet we've straight away gone in uh, to Israel's defence because we were told in Ukraine it would lead to an escalation in World War Three. Is that different in this situation? You know, what is our involvement now that we have used our team, our pilots, our, our aircraft? Uh, it's historic, and I, I think that it's not quite... There is a, a sort of get-out clause in this, in that we are obligated by treaty and other arrangements for the defence of Jordan, where Britain really is a key, possibly the key, key player, and a lot of the stuff was knocked down over, uh, over Jordan. That, I think, is what uh, um, Rishi Sunak was referring to. We are also involved in a counterinsurgency operation in Iraq, and Syria. And that's under that uh, dispensation, if I can put it like that, the extra typhoons were put into action uh, uh, during this. Very interesting how there hasn't been a loud outcry of bringing it to Parliament. It will come to Parliament. There have been requests uh, for, for, the, for this to be discussed. But what the arrangement is, how we're obligated, is very important because, of course, there is one vital piece in the chess game which Britain has and which the Americans really want, and it's Cyprus. The Cyprus logistic base, uh, as important as sending in a few extra typhoon fighter bombers or fighters, were the in-fuel tankers, because they not only in-fuel UK planes, they do it with US Navy planes as so, well. So when you say America wants Cyprus, so what, what, to, what ex, to what extent or how would that deal come about, if at all? No, it's not going to grab it from us. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. didn't put it very well. Um, but it's really, it's an extra aircraft carrier. Right. And, the, and the, it's so valuable from that perspective, the Akrotiri base. It must be absolutely rammed at the moment. Yeah. I mean, the air traffic control must be a complete nightmare. Mm -hmm. I'm not joking, because they're looking into the Gulf and the Red Sea, as well as the skies over northern Israel and going out to the borders of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of Iran. Um, Robert, uh, just, just stay there and let's listen. We're going to listen to uh, Oshi Elman now, who joins us. Mm -hmm. And Oshi uh, lives in Israel. She's a mum of four. And we would just want to find out, um, Oshi, from you, what Saturday night was like when these drones came overhead and how threatened and how scary was it? What, what did you see? What did you experience? First of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so I am uh, a mother of four children, uh, 14 and under, and uh, my children, as I'm sure you can imagine, were extremely anxious and uh, it was a great stress at home. Um, we, they were, you know, sleeping with us. They wouldn't sleep for the whole night. And they, they wanted to be with us. And I'm sure you can imagine, you know, a 12 year old wanting to sleep next to you is obviously a, not a normal situation. Uh, many um, people in Israel were in their bomb shelters. There's houses with bomb shelters built in because unfortunately Israel is used to this sort of, um, uh, attack and um, and it was a it was a particularly uh, stressful time uh, with the sounds of drones and planes overhead the entire night long. 
Um, and just explain to us, Oshi, what the feeling is like in Israel, because it's been many months now, obviously, since the horrendous uh, attack by Hamas and, and the hostage taking. But there has been increasing frustration, hasn't there, with President uh, Netanyahu? And I wonder if his position and your view of him has changed in the last couple of days. So I think we're dealing with a, a very difficult situation. Hamas is uh, one of the terror groups of Iran. Um, Iran funds Hamas. Um, so Iran was directly responsible for Saturday night's attacks. Uh, but uh, Iran funds Hamas, who were responsible for the attack on, uh, on the population of our southern communities. Um, and they're, a, they're an existential, they're a real and existential threat to Israel. So I think Netanyahu is doing everything that he can um, to protect the civilians of Israel um, and protect the security of Israel. And I'm sure you can imagine it's a huge amount of pressure and stress, not just within Israel, considering we have still 133 hostages being held in Gaza by a brutal terror organization, but, you know, stress from uh, and pressure from uh, the international community. And, um, Oshi, what do you think... Um... Mr. Netanyahu should do next? What should Israel do next in relation to Iran? Well, first of all, uh, I think with the situation in Gaza, we need to eliminate Hamas, who, as I said, is part of Iran. It's an arm of Iran. Um, and we need to eliminate them so they cannot commit the sadistic and brutal attacks that they committed on our civilians on October the 7th. Um, I'm sure if London was experiencing something similar, um, they would react in the same way. Um, on Saturday night, we had three over 300 rockets. And I don't know if you got the picture that they're as big as one rocket. Part of one rocket is as big as two cars put together. Um, so um, I believe that, that Israel should be sending a, a clear message to Iran to make sure that they never, ever do this again. Israel's entire population is in a psychological trauma, not just from October the 7th, but now also from Iran, who are directly getting involved and not just getting involved through their uh, terror groups that are stationed throughout the region. Well, Oshie, Oshie. yeah, we wish you well. Um, we hope that your four children have, have managed some sleep since Saturday night now. And um, stay in touch with us as this story uh, unfolds in the next uh, few days and weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank talking you to much. you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, goodness me, when you when you when you hear it, you know, first hand experience. Yeah, shelters and like bunkers, that. That, that, that's the problem. And whatever we say that it may be unlikely that they will mount an attack, they Iran like this again. But that was that's what they must be worried about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing that we take from Oshi is is the, the solidarity with, with with Netanyahu. You just feel very strongly, because it's quite a small country territorially. This is this 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 problem. Every single major uh, uh, centre of population. I mean, small villages as well is now within range of rockets and things from either Hezbollah or or, or, or Hamas. And so the, she got the, the the tension of that ab absolute, absolutely absolutely uh, right. And it's no use saying, oh, the wiseacres say restraint, and you know Iran is unlikely to do it do again. It's a thing you live with uh, by the day, and that's why Netanyahu. I don't think he's. I, I think he's out of political trouble for. Quite a long time now. Okay. Now, in uh, 20 minutes or so, we've got the Shadow Defence Secretary. We're going to be talking to him about um, budgets and uh, what Labour would propose, how they propose, yeah. propose to fund the armed services um, after this. Uh, we asked people when you were on an hour ago their views on this. Uh, Alistair says, why would I want to fight to defend my country when certain politicians are not? Uh, Paul says, young people aren't joining the armed forces because they don't like being yeah. told what to do. They don't like taking orders from anyone. Paul says, Successive governments have tried to destroy patriotism, so why would people want mm. to fight for GB? And so it goes on and on and on. Blame the parents and schools for not encouraging children to join mm. the armed forces. What would you say? Why are we in this situation whereby should we be spending more um, from the national budget? If so, what should we spend it on? And what is the attitude now towards younger people about joining the armed forces? I wouldn't ask any of those questions at all. Mm. Why do you join the services? Why do you do a public service? It's public service across the piece. You do it out of what's known as altruism. I do it, it's a selfless act. But most selfless acts actually bring tremendous self-rewards. 
having said this, that, you know, that they're losing more than they're recruiting at the moment, I was talking to a friend whose son is a platoon commander. He's about to go for selection uh, in the Special Forces. And I said, well, you know, how, how, how does Tom find the, the guys in his platoon? And he's in the parachute regiment. He said, absolutely fantastic. Ab the people who are in there are mm. absolutely up for it. And this is why the social offer of um, the army, and I don't mean in the te teeth, teeth arms, in logistics, in things that we really want to know about, cyber and so on. And by the way, you, you talk about footy and you talk about sport. If you're interested in sport and you want to be, have a job where you can play sport, hey, up to three afternoons a week, join the armed services yeah. for a bit because they can offer a lot to society, but it's what society also offers for the armed services. And, oh, boy, didn't we learn the value and the politicians didn't acknowledge it enough of the services during COVID. That's why I was saying to you, that's the point that has to be put to John Healy. Think about it. Think about it in today's uh, context. We don't want people... I mean, uh, I admire Chris and so on. They shouldn't necessarily be talking to people like Chris Akabuzi and myself. In my day, it was like this. Also, there's one big mistake that's been made over recruiting, which is privatising it, farming it out. What boys, girls want to know is young people serving, coming to say, look, I've had a hell of a good time, this is what's on offer. Why don't you give it a go? Mm. Pe pe you admire people who've really done it. Mm. You don't admire a PR man or a PR lady saying, it might be a good idea, can you sign here? You know, um, uh, it, it would sound like a bit like an insurance contract. Mm. The, the, they have got it so wrong at the moment mm. that uh, I, find it uh, I find it quite embarrassing, particularly when I'm lectured by retired generals who are 20 years younger than me. Yeah. I was watching a documentary <laughs> one evening uh, on telly and I looked like the, it was the Falklands War, and this guy was getting off this landing craft, running into the water or whatever, and I thought, that looks like Robert Fox. And it was you, wasn't it? Yeah. What was the story there? I was the first journalist to shore. Yeah. Um, it, it, it brought me um, in touch with the military. Yeah, they're rascals, whatever. But in the teeth arms, well, right across the piece, you get, come across very, very bright people, native wits. Actually, you don't want a bunch of intellectuals running the army because they'd be hopeless at, at fighting. But there was an enormous sergeant from Bermondsey who came out to me and he said, um, Air yeah, Foxy, he said to me, <laughs> you don't mind me calling you Foxy. He said, um, I said, don't be, be my guest. He said, well, most of us call you something else that begins <laughs> with a left, Foxy. I said, well, that, 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 that's fine, he said. Unlike one of your mates, you know how to talk to soldiers. It's one of the biggest compliments I've ever been Aww, paid. Quite right. Thanks for talking. Thank yes. you, Foxy. Well, from now on, that's how we'll refer to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Don't use the other word. <laughs> <laughs> no, we wouldn't. Not on air, anyway. Um, let's turn our attention to the Rwanda bill, shall we? It's back in the Commons. MPs are back as well, and they are set to consider amendments that are being handed back to them from the House of Lords. OK, let's go to our political uh, correspondent, uh, Catherine Foster, on this one. This is after uh, yesterday we're getting a, a government Minister saying um, this could happen within weeks. Yes, the government is confident that it's finally going to get people on flights to Rwanda in the coming weeks, potentially uh, by the first week of June. Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, uh, indicating as much yesterday. And it's two years yesterday since the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson first announced this scheme. Who would have thought that two years on, not a single person would yet have gone. But yes, as you said, Parliament is back today. The safety of Rwanda bill returns to the Commons, complete with all the amendments that the House of Lords has put forward. Um, there'll be votes on those this evening. It will then go back to the House of Lords tomorrow. Ultimately, it is not the job of the House of Lords to block government legislation, simply to revise it. So it's likely that the um, House of Lords will back down at some point and the bill will get royal assent. Then there'll be a few weeks um, tying up loose ends, getting people ready to go on these flights. One thing that we don't know at the moment is uh, what airline or who, what planes are going to actually be carrying these people. Rwanda Airlines uh, doesn't want to take them. Uh, a lot of commercial carriers don't want to either because they're concerned about reputational damage. It's possible that the RAF may have to be prevailed upon 
for this. And initially, of course, the numbers likely to be quite low. Uh, an embarrassing story a week or so ago that um, some of the accommodation earmarked for migrants had already been sold off. But the government is hopeful that finally, uh, very soon, people are finally going to be sent to Rwanda. The final victim of the stabbing attack at a Sydney shopping centre has been named as a Chinese student. Police have said they will be investigating whether the attacker intentionally targeted women after five of the six killed were female. The first of four criminal trials involving Donald Trump uh, begins today in New York. The former president's facing charges related to hush money payments that were made to a porn star, Stormy Daniels, in 2016. Earlier, we spoke with the former chair of the Nevada Republican Party. That's Amy Tarkanian. More reasonable, rational Republicans um, are, are pretty upset, uh, once again, that he is our nominee. And uh, those who are considered Trump purists um, have pretty much put all of this into the category of political persecution. The city of Liverpool will fall silent today at 3.06 p.m. to mark 35 years from the Hillsborough disaster. 97 men, women and children died in the tragedy at the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest on April 15th, 1989. I don't know about you, but I felt like summer had arrived on Saturday. I was rolled the sleeves up out in the garden, enjoying the sunshine. It was a bit chillier yesterday, but I'm, I feel like I'm ready now for summer. What do you think? Oh, long overdue. <laughs> long overdue. Bring it on. Will it start today? Let's go to Ellie Glacier to find out. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So a very blustery and showery start to the day this morning with brisk northwesterly winds. That will help clear a band of rain across southern and eastern parts out towards the southeast through the rest of the morning. And then we will start to see some sunshine developing as we head in towards this afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and these could turn quite heavy in places, particularly across northern parts of England and parts of Scotland, where we could see some sleet and snow over the hills. With that brisk northwesterly breeze, temperatures struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 degrees in the south and struggling to reach into the double figures further north, but it will definitely be feeling colder than that with the wind. Through Monday evening, showers do continue to push their way southwards overnight and these could turn heavy in places, perhaps some localised flooding, but it will gradually start to turn a little drier as we go through into the early hours of Tuesday morning, leaving plenty of clear skies around and the winds gradually starting to ease as well, but still a chilly night under those clear skies. Temperatures around 5 or 6 degrees in the north, perhaps a touch lower in some rural spots. Tuesday does start a much drier day, though, plenty of sunshine as we head through the morning. There will still be a few showers around, particularly across eastern coasts of England and across parts of Wales and Northern Ireland too, and perhaps the odd one or two bubbling up across southeastern parts. But there will still be plenty of sunshine across northern parts of England. Not quite as windy as Monday and temperatures are still a touch below average, around 12 or 13, maybe 14 degrees in the south and around 10, 11 in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. A wakey wakey rise and shine, your chance to win £10,000, a Greek cruise and luxury travel bundle in a whopping £10,000 in tax-free cash. Yeah, it is our biggest prize of the year so far and here's how you could be a lucky winner. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. 
For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good luck indeed. Still to come, 186 million, yes, million days lost to sickness. Yeah. Is it time to cut down on sick note Britain? We are debating that next. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. <laughs> Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. How often do you take a day off sick, a week off sick, a month off sick? Not saying you don't deserve it or it's not justified or whatever, but over 186 million, that is million days, have been lost to sick notes, according to the Policy Exchange think tank, as 11 million sick notes were issued last year. So, with warnings over productivity in the workplace, is it time to finally crack down on sick notes? Well, that only suggests that you don't see them as legitimate or not. I'm not mm. saying I'm not saying that they are, but you'd only be cracking well, exactly, down. Exactly. Yeah. Something. I mean, if you if you were to enable people to get better, perhaps that would boost productivity. Correct. I suppose that's the Correct. debate. Uh, well, let's get the thoughts of chronic fatigue mentor Georgia Bondi, who thinks we shouldn't be cracking down on sick notes, uh, and HR consultant Natalie Ellis, who interestingly thinks we should. Let's start with you, Natalie. Then, why do you want to crack that whip? 
Okay, so good morning. Um, so the cost of, it, it all comes down to cost essentially for businesses. And at the moment we are looking at a cost of 3,269 pounds per employee if they go off sick for a total of 28 weeks, which is a huge cost, especially to small businesses. And from my experiences, with my clients and working with them every day, um, I would say that managing employee absence is attributing to about 60% of my workload right now. So giving that advice and trying to get people back into work and to try and encourage people back into work is, is actually quite a task in itself. Mm -hmm. Well, Natalie, I, I remember my first job for six weeks um, after leaving school uh, was uh, in the civil service. And I used to watch people, my mouth hung open at how they were able to take exactly the amount of sick days that they were owed during a year. They would, they would actually sit with calendars and go and say, oh, I'm owed a day and a half next month and whatever in, in sick. And they would take it and they would know what to do. Mm. However, um, uh, Georgia, it's, it's not to say that all, all sick days are illegitimate and that they're, they're they're not worthy and it's not to give everybody um, uh, bad news on that front because if you are genuinely sick and you're long-term sick it will affect your pay packet yeah exactly so i think actually if we're looking for a more productive workforce and a workforce with less abs absenteeism what we really need to do is not demonize sick days. When people take sick days when they're a little bit ill, it lets their body recover properly. But if we keep telling workers you're taking too many sick days, what happens is they don't because they're afraid of being fired. Uh, and then it builds up and their bodies just shut down. And, you and, get and, and that's like where someone do. like you comes in. Georgia, just explain to me, what is a chronic fatigue mentor? What do you do? So what I do is I help people who have chronic illnesses like chronic fatigue to figure out how to reorganize their life around new symptoms. Often people are hit with things like chronic fatigue syndrome from long COVID, and they have no idea how to stay in the workforce and how to be productive with these new symptoms. So I, I help them mm. to organize their life and to figure that out. Um, Natalie, is it even legal to say to somebody you're taking too many sick days? I thought you couldn't say that as an employer. You are able to manage absence effectively and it's down to employers to understand what the right approach is and to understand what the legalities are, which is why a lot of people will come to me and ask for my advice to guide them through said processes. One, to make sure that they are having these conversations appropriately, but also that they're staying out of what I call the HR hot water. Um, I think, again, it, it's about managing it properly rather than it being uh, the you know the stick approach and um, telling people you've been off too many times so therefore you know we're, we're going to have to look at other other processes but it's the extent that we're talking about there is so much of it as I said it amounts to sixty percent of of my work and it is a cost that is imposed on employers and within small businesses and the experiences that I have with my clients a lot of them are actually put off employing people now because of all of the implications and it goes wider than just absence it's the additional cost of pensions corporation tax there's so much that goes into employing just one person so I think that all needs to be taken into account as a collective uh, Georgia, Natalie, we've got to leave it there. Uh, we're joined by the Shadow Secretary of Defence. I'm very sorry, we've got to say uh, goodbye to you. This is Labour Shadow uh, Defence Secretary John Healy, MP. John, good morning. Good to talk to you. Good morning. Yeah, John, a lot of talk about uh, budgets and uh, defence spending and Britain's uh, implications in various conflicts around the world. Uh, if elected, what would Labour do with our defence budget? Would you plan to increase it? Yes. Everyone recognises that defence spending has to increase because threats are increasing. And uh, Keir Starmer has confirmed that our ambition would be to see Britain spending 2.5% of what we produce, in other words, our GDP on defence. Uh, it's hard to make those 
firm decisions in opposition. We don't have access to the military advice or the classified threat assessment, so we'd make those decisions uh, within the first year of a Labour government as part of a big uh, strategic defence review. Do you feel as though we've been dithering really on how to defend ourselves as we see yet another escalation this time uh, with Iran and Israel and, and a lot of people you know, just look at the front page of the newspapers this morning waking up and asking me and, and you know just in, in the pub or wherever it might be people saying is this World War three I mean are we prepared do you think. Israel does have a right to defend itself um, and we stand by the right for Israel to defend itself and will step up as we did over the weekend and just will re as we would with other partner countries like Jordan and Iraq in the region. Uh, we have a, an important role to play alongside allies uh, as we did over the weekend. It's defensive action uh, and it was in the face of a, an utterly uh, unprecedented and unacceptable Iranian attack direct from Iran as well as from uh, militia groups in other countries and Israel has demonstrated now that it can defend itself against such an attack it's in a strong position to take a step back to reduce wider tensions in the region now and redouble its efforts to pursue a ceasefire in Gaza which would help with greater stability and it would help avoid dangerous further escalation. Um, but I, I go back to my question really about whether or not you think that the UK is prepared not necessarily about Israel's response and you know us being involved now in this particular escalation as opposed to what we saw in Ukraine where we were really reticent to get our RAF um, airplanes and, and pilots involved in any way this is a bit different and I just wonder whether you think that you know a lot of the mood music that we're hearing from from retired generals and um, experts in the field say that you know Britain is sleepwalking into this crisis. No, it, it, it is different, you're right. Uh, Britain's military role in the region is to reinforce stability. So we are defending international shipping in the Red Sea. We're helping deliver extra humanitarian aid into Gaza. And we're helping defend partner countries like Israel, Jordan, Iraq from attacks. That's a, an important role that Britain can play and is playing. The worrying thing, of course, is what we hear from former defence ministers saying Britain has no plan for defence under the Conservatives, and that's the product of 14 years of failure under the Tories, where they've cut the army to the smallest since Napoleon. They've hollowed out our forces over that period and see morale drop to record lows. So what's required now is a fresh plan to defend the country. Uh, Labour has that plan. We'd reinforce homeland defences. We'd make allies our strategic strength. We'd fulfil NATO obligations in full. We'd renew the moral contract the country has with those who serve. And finally, we direct defence investment first to British jobs and British firms. And in that way, we reinforce our economy, but we also reinforce our national security. Uh, interesting you're talking about a, a moral contract there, uh, John, uh, for those who serve. One of the things we've been talking about in the programme today is falling numbers, recruitment numbers within the, the armed uh, forces. Um, you, you have got a problem there, or you would inherit a problem, um, I, I should say. What can you do about making it uh, more attractive for young people to serve in the Army, in the Navy, in the Air Force? You're entirely right. Uh, the government has failed to meet its recu re recruitment targets for the forces every year for the last 14 years. But you know, it's not a shortage of people wanting to serve. Over a million people have applied to serve in our forces over the last decade, but eight out of 10 simply give up and withdraw their application because it takes too long. So the government only gets to decide to reject or recruit uh, one in five of those who actually uh, who actually apply. Now, what we need to do is improve forces housing. It is unacceptable for those who serve and the families that support them that they live in damp and mouldy conditions. And, and Labour would legislate in our first year also to set up an independent uh, armed forces commissioner reporting to Parliament and not to ministers that would be a strong voice for those who serve uh, and a strong influence on improving service life. 
Yes, finally, I don't know if Labour was informed on Saturday night of the defensive action that the UK was going to take in relation to the Iranian strikes. Um, do you think there needs to be a, a questions, a debate? Um, do you think this whole issue needs to be brought to Parliament so that this is a bit more of a democratic situation? Because, as you say, we don't know where this is going in terms of an escalation, and a lot of people are very concerned about it. So Keir Starmer was informed yesterday morning after the uh, defensive action. We would expect a fuller briefing this morning, but above all, we'd expect the Prime Minister in the House of Commons this afternoon to explain to Parliament and the public what military action was given the go-ahead, what the legal basis for that was, but most importantly, what the UK is now going to do as a government, diplomatically and in other ways, to urge restraint across the region and prevent further escalation. John Healy, Shadow Defence Secretary, thanks for your time this morning. We've got to leave it there. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, stay with us. Uh, in just a moment, we will have Chris Akabusi and Dawn Neeson. They'll be taking us through the newspapers. We'll see you in a moment. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M56 in Greater Manchester. There's a lane closed westbound after an accident between junctions 4 and 5 from Withenshaw to Manchester Airport causing queues. On the M1 in Derbyshire, the inside lane's closed southbound where well, someone's broken down between junctions 29 and 28 near Mansfield. It's slow towards and past there. In Suffolk, the A14 is closed westbound between junctions 44 and 43 near Bury St Edmunds after an accident. There are queues from junction 45 at Ruffham. On the M25 in Essex, the anti-clockwise Exit at junction 30 for the A13 is closed after an accident, with delays off junction 31 as you divert. And the M48 Seven Bridge is closed in both directions between England and Wales because of strong winds. Diversions via the M4 over the Prince of Wales Bridge. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Uh, joining us to find out what's making the news this morning, we have the company of Don Neeson and Chris Akabusi. Very good to see you guys. Um, Don, let's start about the whole uh, Israel situation and these uh, drone attacks from Iran. What happens next and whatever. It's the front of all the papers. This it morning. is the front, and that's why I wanted to talk about it, Eamon, because it is the front of every single newspaper today, even papers like the Daily Star. They haven't splashed on it, but they have got it a, a bit on page one. And I, I think, you know, obviously this happened over the weekend. Um, and I think the Express of their front page have actually nailed it. It's a, it because it says the world holds its breath. 
because we're all waking up this morning going, what happens now? Mm -hmm. We, you know, it, I think we all know what we want to happen. We all want people to get around a table and talk and sort this out. But you've got two, you've got two countries here with Iran and Israel, both led by people that are determined to to not listen to what anyone else in the world is saying. They want to see this out in their own way, and I think it is very scary. Yeah, it's, it's scary and I hate to be crude, but also just for given what we've all been through with the Ukraine war and the impact that that's had on energy prices yes, here, of course. I can't help but think, oh, you know, OK, OK, let's hope it doesn't escalate to a nuclear war, World War III, but also I hope this doesn't cost a fortune. You know, mm. can we really afford as a nation to be spending so much of our income on defences? And, you know, maybe we can't afford not to, but it's an expensive game war. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think... Personally, my concern is the demise of the authority of the United States of America. Mm. Because, actually, Putin didn't listen to America, went into Ukraine. Um, and it appears Iran, the, Mr Biden said, the President Biden said, don't, and they did. And they've gone and bomb, bombed Israel. Um, Biden said to Mr Netanyahu, don't. He did. And they've weighed in, in, in Gaza. So what I'm seeing is this massive superpower mm. that has kept the peace mm. since the Second World War. It's losing its authority. Th that's my, my fear. That actually, and people like Iran are going, actually, we can and we will, and we've done it. Mm. What happens next? Do you think, Chris, it would be different if Trump was president? Or anyone other than or anyone a, apart from Joe Biden. Did, to so, be honest. Yeah, well, so, someone in America has actually changed their name by default to anyone but these two, haven't they? Uh, as in Trump and Biden. Mm. But do you think it would be different if it was Trump? He, does he have more authority than, as you say, Isabel, someone who is probably suffering from dementia? Mm. I uh, what I think is we get lost in the politics, of, uh, personal politics. This is the United States of America. Whoever's involved, mm. you've got these heads. But it is the United States of America that has been responsible for the peace mm. that we have enjoyed. But, the, but that's because it's all on their terms. I mean, you could look at... Correct. It, you no, could you're right. Them, you could look upon them as the good guys, but, you know, a lot of these countries look upon them as the bad guys. 100%, Eamon. I, I, I agree with you. But, but, but everyone has... Focused, the American dollar, the American oil dollar, yes. everything's America, America, America. World control. But all of a sudden, you're getting these countries who are saying, actually, we're not listening to you anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, Saddam tried it, didn't he, in, in Iraq, and said, no, we're going to have uh, Iraqi dollars with the oil. Yeah. And he got put down. That was 1990. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing now in the last 10, 15, 10 years... America pulled out of Afghanistan because they tried to give Afghanistan a bloody nose and Afghanistan weren't having it. Afghanistan are back, you know, the... Um, Taliban. Got the ta Taliban are back in control there. I am concerned because okay. America is losing its authority over the globe. Mm -hmm. What do you think of what Chris is saying? Let us know, get in touch, mm -hmm. and we'll reflect those uh, views throughout the programme. We'll be back with the guys again right after this. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism, when you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it? I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society. And when you would, uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between Islam and Islamism, people like me, you and me, we are drawing that distinction. We're trying to maintain that distinction. But if you uh, look at the commentator from the Muslim community, some commentator, they would like to blur this line and they would ask you, what is Islamism? Where does it exist? Sorry, it does exist. Mm. We see it. And the teacher, this incident is an epitome 
of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Um, we're going through the papers this morning in the company of Dawn Newsom and Chris Akabusi. Um, and we are talking this morning about all the things that are going on in the world, including, uh, Chris, this story about Donald Trump, who's going to be in a New York courthouse for the next six weeks, taking him off the campaign trail. And he's going to be facing some rather salacious um, allegations, not just in relation to this porn star and the, the payments to her, but a whole host of uh, falsifying business records. Um, uh, he's in hot water here. Yeah, I Absolutely. And again, you know, he's obviously the main contender uh, to be the president of the United States of America. And the idea that you, you would have this guy there who could could actually be a felon. You know, he yeah. could actually be charged with uh, all these criminal offences. And um, it's quite a sight to behold because I, mean, I just cannot imagine that sort of scenario happening in the United Kingdom, that we'll be contemplating electing somebody to the most powerful it office in the happen. country. Wouldn't no, happen. no, so, yeah. so it's, just, it's just amazing. But, mm. but, but he has such strong support in the country. And again, just sort of harping back a little bit to what we were talking about before the break, you see, he is seen as a strong man. Now, of course, he goes off on one every now and again, but it seems like water of a duck back. He's got his supporters, and he and America wants to be made great again. And in the image of Trump, yes. they feel they can be no, made great again. Let me ask right you, my again. friend. A lot of people who support him are uh, religious people, right? Yeah. You're a man of religious faith yourself. Mm. Um, would it um, would it go against Trump uh, this relationship with this porn star, for instance? Um, would that kind? Well, I think against... there's three there's three um, sex <sighs> scandals in this particular. Well, child alone, including a love child. There is, Would that rule him out? There, there, there is a saying in the Bible, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Oh, oh. So I suspect that there are many, many Christians who look in their locker... <clears throat> Yeah, you all right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I mean, but it's, it's 91 charges of, uh, across four criminal cases. It's going to keep him busy up until November. But if, and it's looking likely, because the more he faces, the more popular he becomes with the American electorate, um, if he does actually be found guilty and end up in... The first thing he'll do if he's elected president is pardon himself. So right. It's a, and he, yeah, can, it's, he can it's do that a, then, yeah? yeah? Well, it's never been tested, has it? Mm. No. It's never mm. been in this situation. We've just probably got time. Um, to, we've got three minutes. Should we go talk to the, about the Pope? Yeah, let's go to the Pope. Um, I want to talk about the Pope. Um, for 35 years, um, Pope Francis has not watched television. He had this um, experience. He was in a room um, uh, uh, and, and a number of priests were watching the telly for the night in whatever monastery they were in or whatever, and then something very inappropriate came up on, on TV and he basically thought, no, this is not for me and priests shouldn't be um, subjected to this um, sort of thing. 
Um, but can he, can he really, is he not detaching himself from the world mm. by not watching television? Uh, hmm. It says that, again, another bit of a quote, stand guard at the entrance of your mind. And what he seems to be saying, on July the 15th, 1990, he saw scenes of a smutty behaviour, uh, smutty nature, yeah. that he could no longer countenance and still feel as the number one religious person in well, the world. he wasn't then, was he? And so it was obviously just in his role as a, as a humble priest at yeah, that but, point. Um, yeah, and priests shouldn't be, shouldn't, yeah. shouldn't be watching it. Mm. He's, he stayed fa faithful to it and uh, to, to that um, commitment he made to himself. And, look, again, TV has changed, you know... So smutty now. Well, yeah. Well, you, I, I mean, don't you, agree. I don't, you, don't think it's less smutty now. No, you can, you can, see, you can see danglers yeah. and all sorts. You can see Where? danglers. On TV, they show yeah. danglers. I saw a talking dangler. I... I've seen <laughs> Don, I, I... Tommy and Pam. What were you know, doing? Yeah, no. Oh, God, yeah, that I was quite was impressive. They like... swear? We used to be uh, banned from watching Dear Valen on, on TV. <laughs> oh, I love Dear Valen. And we were constantly dressed up as yeah. priests and yeah. uh, criticised the, um, the Catholic Church, but that was never allowed on in our house. We just watched it um, secretly. The thing is, it, <laughs> with, with, with priests, uh, well, of, of any religion, any religious leader, if you're offering guidance and, and hope and, and, and help to people, you have to be in touch with what's going on in real people's lives. Real people will be watching television. Yeah, but you meet, the, you meet, you meet them in a confessional booth, don't you? you, you, you so you, well, yeah, you meet people every single day. You meet... for his, his ministry took him out into the slums um, in South America. I mean, he was in touch with real people rather than perhaps... Yeah. Is the stuff on TV that we see no. real? I mean, presumably he keeps abreast of the news. He's constantly commenting on war yeah, and, yeah, and, and yeah, all absolutely. the rest of it. Maybe he prefers the radio or whatever, but um, I, I think hats off to him. He says he's broken that vow a couple of times. I don't know what the exceptional well, circumstances I well. uh, bet it's a Kardashian. So he was watching the Kardashians. <laughs> you just know it. You have to read his new book to find out. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally without fault. Um, yeah, I think, so there I think we go. the big problem, as you raise there, is how much out of touch with the mm. real world, warts and all, mm. would you become by, by not watching um, TV? But uh, not that there's much... Good yeah. to watch on TV. I think he's probably broken his vow to watch GB News Breakfast. There you go. Yeah. That <laughs> I would be <laughs> Thanks, guys. See you again in 40 minutes' time. Right now, you're going to see what the weather has in store, how we're starting the week. Ellie Glazer. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So a very blustery and showery start to the day this morning with brisk northwesterly winds. That will help clear a band of rain across southern and eastern parts out towards the southeast through the rest of the morning. And then we will start to see some sunshine developing as we head in towards this afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and these could turn quite heavy in places, particularly across northern parts of England and parts of Scotland, where we could see some sleet and snow over the hills. With that brisk northwesterly breeze, temperatures struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 degrees in the south and struggling to reach into the double figures further north, but it will definitely be feeling colder than that with the wind. Through Monday evening, showers do continue to push their way southwards overnight and these could turn heavy in places, perhaps some localised flooding, but it will gradually start to turn a little drier as we go through into the early hours of Tuesday morning, leaving plenty of clear skies around and the winds gradually starting to ease as well, but still a chilly night under those clear skies. Temperatures around 5 or 6 degrees in the north, perhaps a touch lower in some rural spots. Tuesday does start a much drier day, though, plenty of sunshine as we head through the morning. There will still be a few showers around, particularly across eastern coasts of England and across parts of Wales and Northern Ireland too, and perhaps the odd one or two bubbling up across southeastern parts. But there will still be plenty of sunshine across northern parts of England. Not quite as windy as Monday and temperatures are still a touch below average, around 12 or 13, maybe 14 degrees in the south and around 10, 11 in the north. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. 
Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. The M65 in Lancashire is partly blocked eastbound by an accident between junctions 11 and 12 near Burnley, causing delays. On the M56 in Greater Manchester, there's a lane closed westbound after an accident between junctions 4 and 5 from Within Shore to Manchester Airport with queues towards there. In Suffolk, the A14 is closed westbound between junctions 44 and 43 at Bury St Edmunds after an accident. Queues towards there are back to junction 45 at Ruffham. On the M25 in Essex, the anti clockwise exit at junction 30 for the A13 is closed after after an accident, for queues reverting off Junction 31 and back along the A13 towards the M25. The M48 Seven Bridge is closed each way between England and Wales because of strong winds. Versions by the M4 over the Prince of Wales Bridge and hover travel services to and from the Isle of Wight are suspended between South Sea and Ride because of poor weather conditions. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Time quickly approaching 8 o'clock on this Monday morning, the 15th of April. Thank you for your company. You're tuned in to Breakfast with Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. Leading the news on this Monday morning, world leaders call for calm as Israel vows revenge following Iran's attack over the weekend. Well, there is intense pressure on Israel to show restraint, but Israel has said it will respond to what they say was a declaration of war from Iran. Rwanda is back in the headlines today as the government teases the prospects of flights within weeks. Yes, it's two years since the Rwanda plan was first announced. Not a single migrant sent there yet. But the bill back in the House of Commons today, the government thinks it's going to get people on flights by the beginning of June. I'll bring you more shortly. Trials against Donald Trump begins today in New York. He's facing charges over hush money to porn star Stormy Daniels. And in the sport, well, in the golf yesterday, Scotty Scheffler said he'd walk off the course if his wife went into labour during the Masters. She didn't, so therefore he didn't, and he won, and he's now cradling a beautiful new green jacket. Uh, Arsenal and Liverpool have gone a bit wobbly with their title challenges, and uh, Amy's delighted to know that Emma Raducanu is back. It's been a breezy and showery start to the morning, but there will be some sunshine on offer this afternoon. Join me later for the full forecast with all the details.
Hello there, good to have you on board. Top story, world leaders calling for calm after Israel has vowed revenge against Iran after those drone attacks on Saturday night. The United States has warned Israel that it won't participate in any retaliatory strikes. On Saturday night, around 300 missiles were dispatched by Iran, 99% of which were brought down before entering Israel, according to their defence minister. Uh, our Prime Minister confirmed Britain's involvement in shooting down many of those missiles, but he didn't give specific numbers. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. And in the last hour here on Breakfast, we've been speaking with the Shadow Defence Secretary, John Healy. We stand by the right for Israel to defend itself and will step up as we did over the weekend and just as we would with other partner countries like Jordan and Iraq in the region. Right, right. let's get right up to date on all of this. Our Home and Security Editor, Mark White. Where do we go from here, Mark? Well, it's really uh, Israel uh, in terms of where the ball lies now and what their response will be. They are under intense pressure, there is no doubt, from uh, their allies to show restraint now. But from Israel's point of view, they say, you know, 300 plus missiles and drones were fired from a sovereign state uh, towards them. Now, the fact that the vast majority of these drones and missiles were taken out and many by their allies uh, is one thing. And of course, the allies are saying, take the win, uh, take the fact that people stepped up and defended you uh, and that very few of those missiles uh, went th uh, through uh, and don't escalate this into a regional war. But as I say, Israel say that they're not the ones escalating this, that it's Iran that for the very first time has launched an attack from its sovereign soil uh, on Israel. Before then, of course, it had used its proxies in places like Lebanon and Yemen and Syria and the like to uh, launch attacks on Israel. So there's no doubt what happened over the weekend was a very significant escalation. But people are asking Israel to show better judgment, just to take a moment to pause and decide what those next actions, uh, if they happen, will be, mm. knowing that their actions could really escalate the situation. OK, thank you, Mark. Let's find out what any next action may involve. Joining us now, Jonathan Conricus, who's a senior fellow, Foundation for Defence of Democracies. Jonathan, good morning to you. Um, Jonathan, do you, know, do you happen to know what damage this 1% of drones, you guys are saying 99% uh, of them were shot down. What got through and what damage did they do, if anything? Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, the damage is very limited to a runway and uh, some perimeter areas of an Israeli air base in southern Israel. And, um, of course, in uh, human casualties, an Israeli 10-year-old girl was severely wounded in uh, southern Israel. Uh, by the way, most of that damage wasn't from drones, but more from the ballistic missiles that were also fired. Part of that 350-piece Iranian package that was uh, fired towards Israel, drones, many of them, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and also rockets fired by Hezbollah. So a lot, not all of what Iran has in its arsenal, but a lot of what they have in their arsenal was fired at Israel. President Biden has said that um, Israel should view uh, their ability to block m most, as you described, those, those shells on Saturday night as a win, um, which I suppose some people would call quite clumsy language. Um, Lord Cameron, our Foreign Secretary, has been on the airwaves this morning, kind of echoing the sentiments, but perhaps a bit more diplomatically put, saying, you know, this was a second fail for Iran. I mean, is it likely that Israel will be able to draw a line after this and say, look... Um, we, you know, we're, we're going to actually take our time and perhaps a, a, an aggressive retaliation is not what the world needs right now. Yes, you know, I think that uh, deep down, even the people who say take a win, that, that's not, uh, you, you can't really mean that. A country cannot be attacked by another country and uh, be happy with the fact that uh, uh, it was successfully defended. That is not winning. Winning is defeating an enemy. Winning is deterring. And what I totally agree with the advice given is to 
take time, think through it, and have a good strategy in place. And I totally agree with that. And I don't think that Israel is responding in a rash manner, but rather thinking and planning and uh, preparing. Now, the important thing is here, I think, to have a strategic plan and to think, okay, what's the real objective of retaliating? Not just retaliating for the sake of retaliating, but retaliating in order to achieve what? And then once that is defined, very important for Israel not to go at it alone, but to have at least the quiet support and approval of the U.S., but there's also an opportunity for Arab countries in the Middle East, like Jordan, which took a brave stand against Iran, and the Saudis, who are messaging in a different tone since the attack on Israel against Iran. And um, I think that there's an opportunity here if Israel handles its cards and plays them well diplomatically and military to do good things for stability in the future. I, as an Israeli living in Israel, where we are surrounded by Iranian proxy terror organizations, would really like to see Iranian terrorist activity scaled back from our borders. Um Jonathan, uh, you know, a lot of us uh, trying to keep across the complexities of what's going on in the Middle East. Then this attack from Iran happens on Israel, and many people are, are at a bit of a loss to understand what is Iran's problem with Israel. What provoked this attack? Well, the Iranian regime since 1979 has been screaming death to Israel. Uh, I'm sure a few times death to the UK, that's less popular, and death to America, very popular. So that, if you really ask what, what their problem is, the problem is that we exist, that we live in our ancestral homeland and that we are stubborn enough to continue to want to do that and that we have the military ability to, to do so. To be fair, I you've existed that... for, for a long time, I suppose what Eamon's saying is what's changed on, on Saturday night, and I know that Iran have specifically blamed this on the attack on the embassy in, in Damascus, which I think killed seven revolutionary guards and two generals. Do you think that that was the reason? Well, no, I don't think that was the reason. I think that is a pretext that the Iranians are using, and I think that they had their nose rubbed by Israel, uh, reportedly, um, and I think that they are uh, they responded to that. But really, if we are sincere, this isn't about uh, two Iranian generals and seven others being killed. This is another act of aggression of Iran, the first time that they're brave enough to do it by themselves and not use any one of their many proxies. So far, Iran has been waging war against Israel using proxies, and sadly, they've been doing it very well. And they have Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis uh, right close to our borders. The Houthis are further away, but Hezbollah and Hamas and Iranian proxies in Syria are really virtually on our borders. And uh, uh, that is a reality which is extremely problematic, and I don't think that Israel can continue to live with it. Um, and, and when you look at the relations between Iran and Israel, you don't see people walking on Israeli streets chanting death to Iran. You don't see that happening for the last 40 or 50 years, but you see that in Iran. You see statements by the Iranian leadership that they want to wipe Israel off the map. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the lessons after October the 7th is that we should be paying better attention to what our enemies are saying, and we should take them for their word. And if they say that they try to destroy us, then let's prepare for that, and let's not make it easy for them to do so. Jonathan Conricus, thank you very much indeed. Uh, very interesting listening to you there. Thanks for your time uh, this morning. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We'll leave it there. Uh, the time, 10 past eight. Uh, the trouble, troubled Rwanda bill is back in the Commons today. MPs are set to consider amendments from the House of Lords. Now, it comes after the Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, suggested yesterday in an interview that the Home Office was ready to go in implementing the scheme and flights could tick off within weeks, according to her. Well, let's get the thoughts of our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. Could this finally be the week that everything uh, goes through Parliament and those flights could get airbound? Spring, we were told. 
Yes, they did say spring. Uh, Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, sounding optimistic yesterday. Um, looking like the government expects to get flights off by the first week of June, so missing spring by whisker, perhaps. But really, after two years, it's two years and a day since Boris Johnson first announced this scheme, still not a single person to Rwanda. So I think the government will be delighted um, if it manages to get people on flights fairly soon. As you say, Parliament sitting again today. There's going to be um, votes in the House of Commons over a couple of hours tonight, six or seven votes we expect, on the amendments put forward by the House of Lords. Um, the government's going to instruct its MPs to vote all of these down, including one of the more contentious ones, which was the House of Lords wanted an exception for people that had helped the UK um, potentially people like Afghan interpreters. Uh, but the government is having absolutely none of it. It doesn't want to give way at all for fear that the whole thing might then unravel. So it will go back to the House of Lords tomorrow. It's called Ping Pong, probably back to the House of Commons then on Wednesday. But they expect uh, that the bill will become law this week. Then the government have, of course, to find out who is going to physically fly these people to Rwanda. Uh, Rwandan airlines don't want to have anything to do with it. A number of commercial airlines here have said the same. It's quite possible that the RAF will be prevailed upon. And the government are earmarking people uh, to send on these first flights. Worth saying that one of the charities, Care for Calais, are... Um, actively going to be targeting the people that have been selected and helping to mount legal challenges. Of course, the whole point of this safety of Rwanda bill was to stop the courts from blocking these flights from taking off. We won't have very long to find out whether or not that's going to succeed. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much indeed. I uh, just want to draw to people's attention mm. Buckinghamshire Council. Mm -hmm. Buck Buckinghamshire Council is the first council to ask you, the public, to send in footage of motorists throwing rubbish out of their cars. So you could use your dash cam. Yeah. I mean, you know this is a personal gripe of mine, where yeah. slip roads off motorways, mm. main roads and things, just full of rubbish yeah. caused by mostly white van man who has a carton of milk and a sandwich and throws it all out the window. Yeah. And it is disgusting. Graceful. It is, and we know how dash cam footage is used by the police quite a lot. People hand it in, whether it's from their um, car, um, windscreen, or indeed I think doorbell cameras used as well for those as well. But Buckinghamshire Council, sort of trendsetters here, saying don't confront these little outs. Who knows if they're violent or aggressive in this day and age? Mm. Just hand us the footage and we'll do the rest. I'm not, I'm not sure how easy that would be when you mm. think about where the camera's located in your car and what you'd have to see. Mm. Plus, you have to show the registration plate of the car because it doesn't matter who throws the litter out of mm. the vehicle, the person to whom the car is registered, the vehicle is registered, is responsible for that. Mm. So what they're saying is they'll, they'll have a department which will look at footage if you send it to them and they will issue mm -hmm. prosecutions against it. I think this. it's a great idea. Something has to be done. I get to the point now mm -hmm. where I want to stop in the lay-by yeah. close to my house with yeah. a litter picker and get out and pick it up. And I will soon, because my daughter does have a bright pink litter picker because the school's been encouraging them all to do litter picking. And I'm going to go and risk my life and stand oh. on a lay-by because I cannot look at it day after day after day. And it gets blown by the wind yeah. and it gets worse and worse and it just brings the whole area down and no one does anything about it. No, and then it encourages other people to think yeah, this isn't they don't protecting, it. so they yeah. throw stuff away as it's well. Bad for wildlife. The thing, the thing that gets me is that people do it in the first place. That there's no internal clock inside that says, "Don't, don't do that. Yeah. That's the wrong thing to yeah. do. Take that litter home with Absolutely. you." Absolutely. Why would you want to? I mean, I actually don't think physically I could do it. I think I would go to do, um, and something inside mm. me would say, you're not allowed to do mm. that, don't do that. It's the wrong thing to do. So uh, would you use your dash cam? Buckinghamshire Council... I'm going to get a dash cam for it. this very reason. Let's get dash cams installed, yeah, I don't think it's easy. <laughs> I don't think it'd be easy to capture everything. The person, the registration plate... Uh, the act involved. In Maybe that. you have a dash cam. Maybe you live in Buckinghamshire. Let us know uh, what you think about this. Maybe you feel strongly like we do about litter and attempted to get out with a litter picker. Or maybe you have already. Send us your stories. Have your say. GPnews.com forward slash your say. And as for graffiti being art, don't start me. <laughs> but um, I think it brings the whole 
neighbourhood down. I actually would be for council budgets mm. being spent on having mm. clean areas mm. because I think then it lifts people's mood yeah. generally. And how do and I explain don't... that to my children? Look at this mess and they say, Mummy, why are people doing that? I really don't know. Through the eyes of children, everything is so simple. You don't chuck litter on the street. Why, why as adults are we so badly behaved? Well, we, we, we aren't. You mean, I won't be no. associated with no. them. You don't do it, I don't do not. it. Morons do it. People who are just, you know, disrespectful of life around them and surroundings around them. It encourages vermin, rodents. Mm. There are people who would have mice running around their house mm. because of this, which they're... Fly tipping. Brings. I think it's the thin end of the wedge and then it leads to people dumping... What? What did you say? The mice running around oh, your yeah, house. Oh, yeah, well, that's another story. Her cat brought a mouse into the house, which was fine, except it let it go inside mm, the house. Yeah, my husband wasn't there. That anyway. was a lot of screaming. Let's get up to date with other news. The time exactly 17 minutes past eight. The final victim of the stabbing attack at a Sydney shopping centre has been named as a Cheshire as a Chinese student. Police have said they'll be investigating whether the attacker intentionally targeted women after five of the six people killed on Saturday turned out to be female. The first of four criminal trials involving Donald Trump begins in New York today and the former president's facing charges relating to hush money payments to a uh, porn star Stormy Daniels in 2016. Earlier we spoke with the former chair of the Nevada Republican Party, Amy Tarkanian. I think more reasonable, rational Republicans um, are, are pretty upset uh, once again that he is our nominee and uh, those who are considered Trump purists um, have pretty much put all of this into the category of political persecution. Liverpool is to fall silent today at 3.06 p.m. to mark 35 years on from the Hillsborough disaster. 97 men, women and children died in the tragedy at the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest on April 15, 1989. Right, let's turn to the forecast, shall we, for a bit of good news this morning. It was a glorious weekend, certainly was uh, where I live, I don't know about you. Um, Ellie Glazier with all the details. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So a very blustery and showery start to the day this morning with brisk northwesterly winds. That will help clear a band of rain across southern and eastern parts out towards the southeast through the rest of the morning. And then we will start to see some sunshine developing as we head in towards this afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and these could turn quite heavy in places, particularly across northern parts of England and parts of Scotland, where we could see some sleet and snow over the hills. With that brisk northwesterly breeze, temperatures struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 degrees in the south and struggling to reach into the double figures further north, but it will definitely be feeling colder than that with the wind. Through Monday evening, showers do continue to push their way southwards overnight and these could turn heavy in places, perhaps some localised flooding, but it will gradually start to turn a little drier as we go through into the early hours of Tuesday morning, leaving plenty of clear skies around and the winds gradually starting to ease as well, but still a chilly night under those clear skies. Temperatures around 5 or 6 degrees in the north, perhaps a touch lower in some rural spots. Tuesday does start a much drier day, though, plenty of sunshine as we head through the morning. There will still be a few showers around, particularly across eastern coasts of England and across parts of Wales and Northern Ireland too, and perhaps the odd one or two bubbling up across southeastern parts. But there will still be plenty of sunshine across northern parts of England. Not quite as windy as Monday and temperatures are still a touch below average, around 12 or 13, maybe 14 degrees in the south and around 10, 11 in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. So many messages coming in on the website about rubbish. As a child in the 50s and 60s, says Ian Cross, I was taught not to drop rubbish. Even to this day, I have pockets full of receipts, sweet papers, etc., which I put in the bin when I'm at home. Ian uh, Wignall says it's all about upbringing. We were always taught to bin litter or take it home. Parents these days just don't care. Um, an ex-tanky commander, he says, um, my village have a dedicated road sweeper. He does a great job, never any rubbish on the streets. Also, like me, people will pick up a water bottle 
and put it in a bin. Yeah. Uh, mm. um, well, when I was young, there used to be um, national service and no, what, what were they called? The public, public service, service broadcasts. Yeah. And uh, there used to be lots of adverts on litter and why you shouldn't uh, throw it down. But then TV companies don't have a social responsibility anymore. TV companies should be offering these slots free, free to government to say pick this up, don't do mm. graffiti as well. Um, the other thing I have, we have a bridge near us which was built maybe 10 years ago. And I looked at it and I think anything painted in cream or white it's asking is for trouble. disaster, mm. right? I love a rendered house. I love the idea of a white mm. frontage or whatever it is. But I look at it and I think, nope, mm. nope, because go back in three years' time and that's going to be stained, it's going to be all moss-covered mm. and whatever, whatever. And it is, it does. I often sink and go like these houses and they do go downhill but we've got this bridge and it's become moss ridden moss ridden and every time i cross it i think why doesn't somebody from the council not just get a power hose why don't they just come out with a steam cleaner i thought you were going to say graffiti cleaner. i mean i don't mind moss moss looks quite nice and green and leafy and wild no, it looks run down does it look, so no. either painted black brown green yeah. whatever yeah. don't paint it cream yeah. Um, and it looks really rotten mm. looking. Um, or I have a fixation with just having a steam cleaner, just having a big hose. And... Oh, do you know, there's nothing like pressure washing. I love yes, pressure washing yes. the patio. That's like my favourite job. I mean, I say I love doing it. I'll do the first 10 minutes and then I hand yes. it over to the hub. I mean... Do you think of it like <laughs> cleansing your soul? Yeah, all cleaning is like that, but there's nothing more satisfying than getting the, the patio clean. I love it. No. You will not love life as much as Victoria from Hertfordshire. Victoria from Hertfordshire won our spring giveaway. We called her last week to let her know this is how she reacted. Victoria, I've got some really good news for you. You're the winner of the Great British Giveaway. Oh, my God, are you joking? You've won £12,345. Yeah. You've won £500 to spend in the store of your choice. Oh, my God. You've won a pizza oven, a games console, and you've also won a smart speaker. Oh, my God. This is amazing. What, what do you think you might spend the money on? Oh, we're going to Disney, and it's not paid for yet. So this will pay for it. Thank you. And you are going for it, Victoria. We have made that possible. Yes, off to Disney, but you could be off to Greece. Here's your chance to win a Greek cruise, travel goodies, and a £10,000 tax free cash bank balance boost. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel games. Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Funnily enough, um, our makeup artist this morning, Eamon, is Greek, as you know, Eleni. And um, she was talking about how she's going to go home for a month in the summer to the Cyclades Islands, and she just cannot wait for the Greek salads and the um, yes. beautiful wads of feta that you get out there. And I was just thinking, Greece, Greece would be lovely this summer. It is lovely. Mm. Athens is a beautiful place. You ever mm. been to Athens? Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very nice mm. place to be. Um, incidentally, just uh, on the question of uh, Rwanda, mm. I'm just seeing here in the papers today, Britain has entered talks to replicate the Rwanda migrant deportation scheme, mm -hmm. um, if it ever comes about. Um, the government minister saying within weeks now it may come about. Uh, but they've entered talks with Armenia, Ivory Coast, Costa Rica and Botswana. Mm. These are leaked documents that... Uh, that show the government's extent of looking for other uh, uh, countries in a third country deal to get migrants out of here and away somewhere else. Your view's very welcome. We're back with Paul in the sport right after this. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm.
I'm delighted to welcome Andrew Doyle, who was behind that comedy event in Edinburgh last night. Andrew, great stuff. Look, what's the mood like on the ground in Scotland? Well, I mean, certainly at last night's event at Comedy Unleashed in Edinburgh, there was a sense of relief that we're all gathering and we're all laughing at this stuff. We're just laughing at the way that the police have approached this, the way the SNP have approached it. Uh, various people from various of the protected characteristics that you must not uh, mock or offend were mocking each other. It was just a reminder that actually these are just jokes. We're just having a laugh. We're just exercising our uh, creative freedom and our our freedom of speech. The mood, I think, is generally uh, one of disbelief that, that, mm. that Hamza Youssef and the SNB have pushed through uh, this crazy authoritarian draconian law, irrespective of all the criticisms that, that have come from senior members of the police, uh, members of the judiciary, uh, members of the public, uh, the, the QCs, various, various bodies have all said this is not workable because the police have said that they will investigate absolutely every complaint. And although they've said they won't target comedians, they're going to end up investigating comedians if the complaints come in, because that's what they've pledged to do. Well, that's it. So, conceivably, and this is how ridiculous and unenforceable it is, if someone had reported you last night in the audience, the police would have had to have investigated you, wouldn't they? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, whether they would have taken it any, any further will come down to the individual police officer. We, we had uh, Siobhan Brown from the SNP on the BBC the other day, and she was asked very clearly about this. You know, who makes the decision what to investigate and what not to investigate, how to take it forward? She said it's a matter of individual police judgment. Now, the problem with that, of course, is there are activists within the police force in Scotland. We've caught them at it before. Now, the fact that they're not going to pursue J.K. Rowling after she challenged them uh, is partly probably just cowardice because she's got mm. a lot of power and clout behind her. But if it, if it was a complaint about us, a bunch of yeah. comedians in a small room in Edinburgh, they might well have taken it further. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Now, uh, one of the well, one of the greatest sporting weekends that you'll ever get in a year—the Grant National on oh, a Saturday, yes. the Masters finishing on a Sunday—it's so hard to beat. So hard to beat. Yeah. Uh, the winner of the Masters, tell everybody, Scotty Scheffler. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that Xander Schauffele would be in there, so it'll be a Scheffler Schauffele. Oh. Wouldn't that be great? And Scheffler and Schauffele walk up. I'd love to be able to do that, but it wasn't the case. So Scheffler said, yes. he said his wife was uh, pregnant, right? And she's, That's uh, correct. And he says, if she goes into labour, while I'm on the last round off the Open, yep. I will leave the Open and tend to her. Yes. What uh, rubbish. <laughs> I, was... I cannot believe... I can tell you, said, you know, I don't care who it is, I would not be leaving if I was in the last round of the Open in the league. My husband would be or he'd be out. It's the Masters. It's I the don't Masters. care. You knock me up. You come and deal with it. That's a lovely romantic way of putting things. It would be things. easier for you to have another child than it would be oh. for it to get into the final <laughs> of the Masters. Man. See, I don't know. <laughs> See, the thing is, that's the thing with Scheffler. He's the world number one and he's the greatest golfer there is around at the moment. And he did say that, and he's, you know, he's a god furring man, and, you know, and he loves his wife, and Meredith was, you know, and she's, she, he said that if she goes into labour, as I'm playing the last round, if I get the call, I will walk off the course. So I just wonder if the call came in and he'd go, 
Meredith, I just got a couple of holes. Yeah. You know, just, just hang busy, on. I'm just busy at the moment. <laughs> hang on. Yeah. Imagine yeah. if they it just was a false the... alarm. Imagine if it was just Braxton Hicks and it wasn't really the Eggs, full nine yards. Imagine yeah. that. He wouldn't be too happy about that. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway no such there problem. was no problem. Would you go? Would I go? You know what? First time round was his what first do you baby. Think? What I, do you think I would? I think you would, but I would. I would. Yeah. Oh, good for you. I would. Quincy. I absolutely would. Would it? Okay. What the about masters? But missing the birth of your child. Missing the masters. Missing but the, the first child. child. What about the second or third child? You know, and you're and you're at the masters. You'd, second uh, or third, I think it's more forgivable as a, as a woman. Oh, but for the first one, you're terrified. I mean, back in the old days, though, it would be expected. I know. Expected yeah, my dad wasn't there. I don't you think, can't yeah. be there. Yeah. What would you want to be there for? But anyway, well, I'll tell you who was there. Fine. Everything's Emma fine. Emma Raducanu was there, right? Um, so she, this is. Um, the Billie Jean King Cup. Yes. <laughs> I do think Billie Jean King now there was a tennis player. Absolutely amazing person. Absolutely. Absolutely. In, in history. Emma Raducanu, uh, not Stop so it. convinced. You're not going to put no, her no, up no, there. No, 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 no. I'll tell you what I was, I was pleased with. I mean, I don't know what sort of Mickey Mouse tournament this is. But, <laughs> well, but um, Billie Jean she, is not she a lover did year win. Anymore. She did win. Emma Raducanu won. I was very pleased yes. that one of the reasons she won was this was on clay. Yeah, it's on clay. Now, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a country thing. Do you remember the old Whiteman Cup? So it used to be Britain versus America, but then they realised that America would always oh. win it. So it's kind of like the got, Davis Cup. got huge crowds watching it. <laughs> Davis Cup. That's an unfortunate Why was she there? That Crikey. Was yeah. Honestly, for goodness sake, these cameramen these days. There's Sam, that's more like now, it. Now, what I couldn't work out about her shorts was, are her <laughs> shorts... See, they're pulled up to the side there. Yeah, that was the ball. That's just the there. ball, yeah. That was her... So she did that. Yeah. They would, they would have come down as normally... Line flexing shorts. Yeah, but, but maybe she... through all the stretching, there's been a slight movement no, in the shorts. I wasn't sure if that was fashion or. Um, she, she could wear could... anything. She's a beauty. But I'm glad to see she's winning again. She there's says she's, she's playing the, the the tennis of her life what are you and of her career. About? It's in a oh. tournament that no one's ever heard of. No, now listen. That's and she not won fair. a game. That's not fair because it, it's no, this usual nonsense again. It took, it's a country go, cup. Oh, she's back in time for Wimbledon, whatever. She's not back. Stop. But she did win, which I'm glad to see. I agree with you there, but it's not. Mickey Mouse tournament, it's not, because all the countries that were involved, they beat France, and it was in France, so yeah. the actual tournament, there's loads of other countries that be involved in it, so basically Britain have qualified now to play in the finals of the Billie Jean King Cup. Yes. Or okay. the Mickey Mouse Cup. Okay. Okay. Stop it. But anyway, but she, but she will be there. She, yeah, it's early days, she said she's playing the best tennis she's ever played, I've got something else for you. Tell me what you think this is. I think this is something um, I, I, I've got for you. I just want you to tell me what you think it is. Now, what is that? What is that there? What that is that roll? That is a carpet. Are they okay. rolling out a carpet? Or, or, or is it turf? Have a look. Keep is looking there. Is it it'll turf? Become it's my new game. Oh, what is, is it an athletics track? We're getting there. Yes. What athletics track a is it? A running track, a 100 metres track, an 800 metres track. where? Well, you oh, see, my, for my the Olympics family. in Paris. Yes! Oh! Stop I, um, my uh, father was a carpet fitter, and basically that's the sort of thing he had. Screeding. That's but you see, screeding. But, but, see, I think this is incredible. So they've put this down over turf, and then they're going to have to lift, lift it again? Well, it's, it's, it's not permanent. I, I don't know whether I think it will be permanent because it's around the outside of the oh. of the stadium. So there it is, and it's also it's a purple track, which That's is a, which is a rare thing. Very nice. But so you, and there it is you, being you think that will stay? I think it will stay. I mean, the thing is, you've got oh, the the green in the middle. Like that. That's it. That's nice. When you how don't. can we get tickets to the Paris Olympics? Well. I think that they've they've had all the ballots. Have they? And the thing is, though, I did look at that. But not only were they really expensive, but then you've got to find somewhere to stay. And well, no, you don't have to. Can... You can nip across in a day and back. Do you think so? Yeah, that's what the well, year Well, I is. could see what I could do. I'll have a look have and a have, a, have a quiet word. Yes, Maybe please. you could do the show from there. I mean, the oh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, that'd be mm. nice. Mm. I, I went to the Commonwealth Games um, when they were held in, in Manchester. Yeah. And uh, never saw rain like it. You know. <laughs> oh, it was awful, wasn't it? Was terrible. It? Yeah, yeah, it really Do you know was. who sat beside? Sherry yeah. Blair. I was going to guess that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who I sat beside? She was good crack, I reckon. I bet you had a good chat with her. Yeah, really good friendly. Chat with her. I saw her the she other day. She loves her athletics, does she? <laughs> um, no, I don't know, but he, I saw I saw where she works. I was um, I had to I passed by her office front door and she came out. It's not a shopper. Not because she knew I was there, but I just <laughs> yeah. came out and got into a car. So, do you remember yeah. we sat next to her during the five thousand metres? Oh, we had yeah, all that. Well, stuff. she will, she will. Yeah. Did you go to the London Olympics though? 
See, that no, was fabulous. No, no. That was fabulous. Paris no. is, is gearing up. See, if you go to yeah. Paris now, everything is Olympic this and Olympic that. Mm. And I love the Olympics. I, don't I love the Olympics. The politics of the Olympics, mm. but when it actually comes to the Olympics, I adore yeah. it. So, actually, my son just did a school Easter holidays project about the history of the Olympics, Good. and we had to learn that the only way that you can be late for an Olympic game without being disqualified is if you're in a shipwreck. <laughs> is that right? What did you say? The only way you What'd can you be say? late for no, an Olympic. that bit. What was the bit? Shipwreck. Oh, ship. Oh, right. Lovely. <laughs> That's good. You're very naughty. You are naughty. The first time I became aware of the Olympics was the 68 Mexico Bob Olympics. Because we used to get from petrol stations, from ESO and whatever, sticker books. And the coins. The coins yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And for the 1970 World Cup and all sorts of yes. things. Yes. But petrol stations, they don't give away gifts no. anymore. No. I've got a little mobile Squelcher thing. books. You used oh, to get those, Squelcher yeah. books. And used to be a, I've got a poster with all the stickers of all the badges of the clubs. Yeah. Yes. They wouldn't care about yes, that. Yes, from A to Z. Z. Yeah. That was it. Right yeah. Yeah. They used to fight to the death in the ancient Olympics. They very much did. Yeah. But they only brought it back in 1896, you see. Uh, so that was... We'll do this. As by the then. months go on, history we'll go through of the, the Olympics. History. I love it. I've got well, lots. Well, we're not bringing you back again. <laughs> you okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, fair enough. See you in the morning. I tried my hardest. We enjoyed it. It's lovely having you back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Speaking of bringing people back, we have Dawn and Chris Akabusi after this. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M56 in Greater Manchester. There's a lane closed westbound after an accident between junctions 4 and 5 from Woodland Shore to Manchester Airport. There are queues from the M60. In Suffolk, the A14 is closed westbound between junctions 44 and 43 at Bury St Edmunds after an accident. There are queues from junction 45 at Ruffham and long delays too as you divert. In London, the A5 is closed in both directions on the roundabout at Staples Corner at Cricklewood after an accident with queues back along the M1 towards there. On the M25 in Essex, the anti-clockwise exit at junction 30 for the A13 is closed after an accident. There are queues on the A13 towards the M25 and long delays too through Purfleet off junction 31 as you divert. And the M48 7 bridge is closed each way between England and Wales because of strong winds with versions by the M4. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Um, while, while you were away and we were still here, Chris Akabusi's <laughs> had to pay... <laughs> He's had to pay for his car park. 
<laughs> ticket um, on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up the will to live. <laughs> I didn't make it either. It was all thumbs and toes. No, no. You should have oh, kept no. playing. I'm gonna... <laughs> I highlighted yeah. it to the yeah. parking that attendant. Really He's um, going to be after you now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lovely car <laughs> dangling <laughs> from a... I'm going to don't nick it. Please don't oh, nick the car. Very I'm nice go. motor. <laughs> Chris Agabusi and Don Neeson uh, with uh, stories that are getting people talking today. Um, oh. The sun are carrying a story today, Don. The NHS have unfurled a banner. This, this is a flag. What is this flag celebrating? This is, our uh, yeah, for everyone out there waiting to get a doctor's appointment or a hospital appointment, I think there's about seven million of us on those waiting mm -hmm. list. You'll be reassured by this story. This is the NHS. This is one hospital in particular, uh, University Hospitals of North Midlands, one of the worst performing in the entire country, have unveiled a banner welcoming people to the hospital, listing the 21. The headline says sexes. There aren't 21 sexes, right? There are two biological sexes. What they mean, I think, is genders. And they are listing... I mean, they start with the rainbow flag, which is lovely. There's 21 different flags on this big banner welcoming people to hospital. They're trying to be inclusive and diverse, as you are these days. The rainbow flag, absolutely fine. We all understand that one. But there's, there's someone here that I have got no idea what they even mean. Well, give um, us an example. OK. Um, Demi-romantic. Demi-romantic? Oh, well, it was half, half romantic. I don't know. <laughs> What, what? A, re a, a romantic attraction to someone after becoming emotionally close. What? What? Say what? that again. <laughs> so, you I, see, the nonsense <laughs> with all of this is, no matter who you are, what, what you are, is you should just be welcome within the NHS. That's everybody. Exactly. Oh, what about this one? Uh, new Troys? New, new Troys. Troys. Yeah, New Troys. N E U T R O I S. She's just neutral about everything. <laughs> Everything in, Referring in... to a person who lacks a specific gender identity. You see, honestly, that is just... This is the Royal Stoke Hospital. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just pandering to wokeness. Mm. It's, just, it's just stupid, really stupid. And if that takes up somebody's time or any sort of budget, it just... It, the, what isn't in this story is how much it's cost the hospital. It's, it's one of the worst performing um, national trusts um, in, the, in the country. And it comes after England, NHS England um, come under fire last May for listing 18 gender options on a patient form. Yeah. It's like, just give me my cancer operation, please. I don't care. Chris, here's, here's a really interesting story. Um, you know, we're very much aware of uh, employers under pressure to let employees work from home. But you're going to take this one a step further. Yes. Um, so, you know, since COVID, we've all, like I said, we've all got... Uh, used to the idea that employers uh, can work from home, do work from home. There are certain jobs that can be done down the line through um, social, you know, you know, Zoom or whatever. Um, but now these research is about not just working from home, but this, the headline is, life is a beach. Working from the beach, mm. abroad, getting to live in other cultures and see other ways of working and yet logging in and doing your work from home. So I was wondering what sort of jobs you can actually do mm. on the beach. What sort of jobs could you do on the beach? Um, of course, research you could do on the beach. Um, you could do... Phone counselling. Co yeah, exactly. Could, yeah. Coaching, electronic mm. coaching. I'll tell, you the jobs the you, I'll tell you the jobs you can't do from the beach, and it's mostly the working class jobs, Chris. Mm. You Plumbers. can't be a lorry driver. Yes. You can't be a, plumber. Can't be a, sweet, yes. a, a street digger. cleaner. Yeah, mm. this is a very much yeah. a middle class thing, isn't it? It's yeah. If you're in administration or, or, or a civil servant, possibly. But there's 9.25 9 there's, there's 9 million employees that are actually now working from home. Mm. So uh, if, if you can do it in... Name a city in the UK. Why, why can't you? you do it? Well, this is interesting because this comes two days after Italy have issued these new year-long visas, mm. which post Brexit, I think, is the longest one yeah, yet in yeah. the EU. Yeah. Saying Brits, come along, you can get an, um, an what do they call it, a nomad digital nomad visa. Mm. Yeah. So you can be working from Italy mm. from is there the a beach. Flag for that. Very <laughs> <laughs> good. Stoke Hospital could fly for you. <laughs> but it does make sense. Only nomad gender at the same time as being a digital nomad. <laughs> mm. um, um, oh dear! But, 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 anyway. but, but, but it's great for those countries that got sunshine because you are going to get tourists. Well, they're not tourists officially because they are working there. But you're going to spend yeah. your money there. The problem 
is, Chris, if you can do your job right from a beach, the people that are employing you can go, well, if you can do your job from a beach on, say, I don't know, £45,000 a year, we can go to <clears throat> a third world country, pay someone a lot less to do the same job. Don't have to be in the office, be anywhere in the world, and they're going to be a lot cheaper than you are. Yeah, that's yeah, also true. true. Very good point. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and after that, we'll be back with Dawn Neeson and Chris Akabusi to take us through some more of the stories making the headlines. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Dalby, weekdays from 3 p.m. This new hate crime bill on women's issues, you think this is the least funny April Fool's joke in history? Yeah, although the Scottish government and the Scottish police do seem to be trying to make a bit of a joke of it when, you know, their campaign Hate Hurts is fronted by a hate monster who's a sort of cuddly, bright red, uh, Muppet-style thing. And some of the things that Hamza Youssef said about it were from a, a soft play centre over the weekend. But yeah, it's really not a joke. It's not actually clever lawyers who know the wording of the law, who enforce the law. It's the police. And the police have basically not been trained on this at all. There's a two-hour online training course they're meant to have done, and lots of them haven't already done it. And we know from the way that the police have been talking about it that they're wildly overstretching what it might actually be to be, in particular, abusive, which is one of the words in the new law, and specifically on the issue of transgender identity, to claim that just noticing the fact that there are two sexes and that sex can't change is meant to be hateful. That you know, even after years of trying to study it, I can't understand why people hold this belief. But it's part and parcel of a pattern of legal measures that the Scottish government has either introduced or has sought to introduce. So it tried to introduce gender self-ID, but that was overruled by Westminster because it was out of the power of the devolved government. It's still attempting to bring in a conversion therapy law, which sounds nice but isn't nice. It actually criminalises proper ethical treatment of gender-confused youngsters. Uh, they're trying to say that uh, men who have certificates saying that their women count as women for a particular measure to do with public boards. And then this uh, hate crime law, which tries to make it really difficult for someone to talk in a factual, reality-based, clear, understandable way about all these measures. It all adds up to a sort of an authoritarian attempt to deny the fact that human beings are mammals and come in two sexes, and that recognising that matters for women's rights especially. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Sean and Chris hmm. have got uh, stories that are that are making the uh, the news. What's caught your eye, Isabel? Well, we were just talking in the break up there about the Olivier Awards, and I don't know if you were lucky enough to see Sunset Boulevard or have been yet to see it in the West End, but Nicole Scherzinger has been absolutely sensational, I hear. And she won big last night, along with some other familiar faces and names. Um, Dawn, bring us up to speed. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, I like looking at the frocks, to be honest no, with so you. Do I. Yes, it's so like, do it's I. like, um, yeah, I mean, it was the Olivier Awards last night. This is where we need the other favourite. Chris in our world, is Mr Biggins, who loves the theatre. He was um, probably there. It's probably why he's not here this morning. Well, exactly. Yes. Uh, he's on his cruise. Um, but Sarah Snook, who is in um, Succession, Succession um, she won big as well. She was up against fellow TV star Sarah Jessica Parker from Sex and the City. Um, Sheridan Smith went in her pants. Yeah. She was just wearing a very see-through dress. Nicole Scheringer looked absolutely... I'm sorry, this is such a girl thing. She looked stunning, beautiful black dress. Um, but the, the one thing... Our, um, Dear England won as well, evidently, which is a, a, a play about um, Southgate's reign as England boss. And I have to say, I've been to it, and that is brilliant. And that's the only thing I can talk knowledgeably about, apart from the lovely frocks. 
It, that, that one big, didn't it? And they were really yes. praised for yes. being really inclusive. Well, because it brought <laughs> football fans into the theatre and theatre fans learnt stories about football and it was two worlds that don't normally collide with huge success. And I, I found that a little bit patronising yeah. as someone that actually does go yeah. to football every week and I have been known to go to the theatre. It's like, you know, those days are gone. You know, football fans can go to the theatre. You are allowed to go to. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it is a great, it's a great play if anyone wants to see I've been to the Olivier's and they, they're an award ceremony that mm. has done very, very well. I have to say, and, uh, and a good turnout of big names. Mm. Yeah. Theatres all close on a Sunday, don't they? Yes, so, yeah, yeah, I think most of them yeah, are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but football was happening yesterday, unfortunately, for us West Ham fans. <coughs> <coughs> Very good. <coughs> right, uh, let's talk about uh, Liz Truss's memoirs, Dawn. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, she's detailed her short stay in Downing Street, including how her husband predicted her premiership would end in tears. It will end in tears. You want that kind of support from your other <laughs> half, don't you? Um, yeah, 49 days she was Prime Minister and she has written a book that goes on for a lot longer than that, um, detailing what happened. I mean, it's the, the, the Daily Mail are serialising it um, and it kicked off on... I think it kicked off on Saturday when she was detailing about how when she moved into number 10, it was infested with fleas. Mm. Really? Yeah, I, I know, I know. And she blamed her own Boris Johnson's dog, Dylan. Mm. But because it was living there beforehand, obviously. So that was that was the only thing I retain about it. It might it, have been him. It might not have been his dog. You know. <laughs> well, he has got rather interesting hair, hasn't he? She said a woman with Fleas, equally messy hair. Like that. But I mean, she also, the, one of the serious points. I mean, uh, apart from her husband saying this is ending in tears, and I completely understand why he said that. But they had two young daughters as well. And one of the more poignant bits from the book was when she was talking about the effect it had on her two girls. And she goes, most most people's kids don't experience their parents' sort of, like, faults spread worldwide. And her little girl, young girls, are in their routines, had to go through that. And, and, and when, when she's talking like that, it brings home um, the family side of what it's actually yeah. like to be a politician. Um, Keir Starmer's done the same. He said the only thing that keeps him awake at night ahead of basically or fleas. winning. <laughs> <laughs> well, it should be fleas. But, no, it's the impact that his premiership would have on his children, on children and how you have no, normality. Absolutely. Not least because he had all these um, activists last week mm. turning up outside his house. There's yes. this growing trend, isn't yeah. there, of going personal yeah. uh, on people Which whose is... views you don't share. And suddenly the kids, are can they think, in harm's way? And they don't on. choose and, to and be there. And Keir Starmer, on the other hand, he had people camped out in his garden That's what I'm well. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the okay. two things of, with, with this, this trust that I've, I've heard from the book was, one, uh, the Queen, that uh, two days after she's been to see the Queen, the, the Queen's... You're not linking there. those two things, are you? Oh, God, that's <laughs> absolutely, absolutely not. But Chris, that touched Chris, me. Meanwhile, there's a story about there's going to be a lot of new MPs in Parliament. Um, so far, 100 have said they're standing down at the next election. Yes, absolutely right, yeah. And um, it's this... The changing of the guard, um, new brooms sweeping clean, and the opportunity to do things a little bit differently. Um, maybe focus a little bit more on the constituency side of of the MPs' workloads. Um, not so much with the Westminster. Westminster, they work until 10 o'clock at night. Not great for you if you are an MP and you're a lady and you've got a fam... Well, and a bloke, I guess, as well. But, you know, if you've got a young family. So, have a look at... Will things change with the new guard... Old guard going out and new guard... Mm coming in. I think there's just too many of them and all on, you know, salaries costing the taxpayers. Do we really need constituency MPs in the same way that we used to when people needed a representative to go up to London? It's, it's not so it's much so the salaries, outdated. it's the expenses. Yes. So if you, Two houses. If you live in Staffordshire or yeah. Belfast or wherever it is, you, Trains. you have to, all those expenses have to be paid. Yeah, about I don't think we need 600 or whatever it is. So Chris, if you could, uh, would you stand as an MP? Not, not a chance. Isabel? No, I, I care a lot about the issue and I feel like I've got public service in me, but it's I, I don't feel connected to any party and I also don't feel like I could withstand all the bruising Absolutely personal not. attack. Mm. Yeah, you have got to be very thick-skinned, mm. haven't you? What about you, Eamon? Uh, I wouldn't be able to take a whip, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I'm There's no not. way. Not what with us. I'm too individually <laughs> minded. Um, what about you, Don? No, I couldn't. No, I, 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 you know, no way. No, I, I think, on, on a serious side, I think what they have to put up with these days is appalling. And we all know we lost Joe Cox, we lost yeah. David Amy. Yeah. I think it's, it's not worth yeah. it. So they're in the problem. They're in the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. OK, guys, thanks a million. Enjoyed Thank you. you today. Thank you very much indeed. Here's the weather picture. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.
Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So a very blustery and showery start to the day this morning with brisk northwesterly winds. That will help clear a band of rain across southern and eastern parts out towards the southeast through the rest of the morning. And then we will start to see some sunshine developing as we head in towards this afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and these could turn quite heavy in places, particularly across northern parts of England and parts of Scotland, where we could see some sleet and snow over the hills. With that brisk northwesterly breeze, temperatures struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 degrees in the south and struggling to reach into the double figures further north, but it will definitely be feeling colder than that with the wind. Through Monday evening, showers do continue to push their way southwards overnight, and these could turn heavy in places, perhaps some localised flooding, but it will gradually start to turn a little drier as we go through into the early hours of Tuesday morning, leaving plenty of clear skies around and the winds gradually starting to ease as well, but still a chilly night under those clear skies. Temperatures around 5 or 6 degrees in the north, perhaps t a touch lower in some rural spots. Tuesday does start a much drier day, though, plenty of sunshine as we head through the morning. There will still be a few showers around, particularly across eastern coasts of England and across parts of Wales and Northern Ireland too, and perhaps the odd one or two bubbling up across southeastern parts. But there will still be plenty of sunshine across northern parts of England. Not quite as windy as Monday, and temperatures are still a touch below average, around 12 or 13, maybe 14 degrees in the south, and around 10, 11 in the north. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M56 in Greater Manchester. The lane closed westbound after an accident between junctions 4 and 5 from Wickenshaw to Manchester Airport with queues from the M60. In Suffolk, the A14 is closed westbound between junctions 44 and 43 at Bury St Edmunds after an accident. There are queues from junction 45 at Rougham and long delays too as you divert. The M487 bridge is closed each way because of strong winds. Diversions via the M4 over the Prince of Wales Bridge. On the M25 in Essex, the anti Otherwise, exit at junction 30 for the A13 is closed after an accident causing delays. In Kent, the A249 is closed southbound from the M2 at Sittingbourne to the M20 at Maidstone after an accident and fuel spill. And hover travel services to and from the Isle of Wight are suspended between Southsea and Ryde because of poor weather conditions. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. A very good morning to you. It's nine o'clock. It is Monday the 15th of April. You are very welcome to breakfast. With Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster leading the news, world leaders call for calm 
as Israel vows revenge following Iran's attack on Saturday. Well, there is intense pressure on Israel from its allies to show restraint. Lord Cameron, the UK Foreign Secretary, has said he hopes Israel will be smart as well as tough. Rwanda is back in the headlines today as the government teases the prospects of flights within weeks. Yes, MPs back in Parliament today. They will be voting down the amendments from the House of Lords. Uh, the government expects the safety of Rwanda bill to pass into law later this week and to get people on flights to Rwanda over two years since the scheme was first announced. I'll bring you more shortly. The first of four criminal trials against Donald Trump begins today as he faces charges over a hush money payment to porn star Stormy Daniels. And we'll be speaking to royal biographer Angela Levin in just a moment about Prince Harry's charity polo match in Miami. It's been a breezy and showery start to the morning, but there will be some sunshine on offer this afternoon. Join me later for the full forecast with all the details. Well, it's our top story this morning. World leaders have called for calm after Israel has vowed revenge against Iran after drone attacks on Saturday night. America has told Israel it won't participate in retaliatory strikes on Saturday. Around 300 missiles were dispatched by Iran, 99% uh, of which were claimed were brought down uh, before uh, entering Israel. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, yesterday confirmed the UK's involvement in shooting down many of those missiles. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. And just a short moment ago, uh, we spoke with the Shadow Defence Secretary, John Healy. We stand by the right for Israel to defend itself and will step up as we did over the weekend and just will re as we would with other partner countries like Jordan and Iraq in the region. Uh, let's get perspective on this from our Home and Security Editor Mark White. Mark, good morning. Saturday night, now Monday morning. Where do we go from here? Well, it's just that intense pressure that's continuing from allies, not just privately, but very publicly. Lord Cameron saying this morning that, you know, this was a double defeat as far as he was concerned for Iran. Not only did the attack fail in that the vast majority of those missiles and drones launched at Israel were shot down, but also, he says, it shows to the world that Iran is the malign actor in that region. And so why not do something about it? Well, then? indeed, and that's what Israel is arguing. It's not just a malign an actor that launched a state-on-state -state attack on Israel on Saturday, mm. but through its proxies has been attacking Israel for many years, causing countless numbers of deaths. So now, of course, it is a state-on-state -state act. Israel says that can't go unanswered, uh, but what that answer will be only time will tell. What they are saying publicly at this stage is they will respond, but what they will do will be something of a manner and at a time of their choosing. Israel has said that the, the drone attacks and, and the missile attacks on Saturday night were a declaration of war. Iran has said, as far as they're concerned, the matter is resolved and done with. Will Israel take any notice of that, or do you think that they will feel they still need to show their dissatisfaction, even when you've got President Biden saying, look, we're not going to back you if you take any further action, and everybody from the United Nations to you name it calling for calm heads, even China at this point? Yeah, well, you've got, as you said, President Biden there saying, take the win. You know, it's the, the fact that it wasn't just the US, but also the UK, Jordan and Saudi Arabia in that region all coming together and showing support for Israel and taking down those drones and taking down those aircraft in that area as well. So the, President Biden would say that the smart thing to do now would be just to breathe, just to consider what your next step will be and not rush in to something that could really escalate this into a regional war. Mm. Because the real concern, of course, 
uh, of a regional war is not necessarily that it would affect us here, but it may well do in all kinds of attacks spurred from that in the West. But there are many interests for the UK and the US, other Western allies in that region. We have bases in that region as well that could potentially, and diplomatic missions, that could potentially come under attack. I have no idea how big a military strength Iran is and why people are so frightened uh, about dragging them into conflict. Um, to me, it seems quite simple. They attack you, they give you a bloody nose. Well, you know, the fact people say 99% of these were, were brought down, whether they were, whether they not. They fired so many ballistic missiles and drones in, into somebody's country. Are you kidding that they get away with this? Um, so, so how big is Iran? How dangerous is Iran? It is dangerous. I mean, from its uh, aerial point of view in terms of its air force, the aircraft, it has F-15 old uh, aircraft that aren't up to much and would not match uh, Israel's uh, air force. But what they do have is the biggest stock of ballistic missiles in that region, some 3,000 mm. ballistic missiles, and many times that number of crews and other missiles. And then the drones, the Shahid drones, that they've been sending off to Russia uh, to take, uh, you know, uh, for use in, uh, Ukraine. In, in Ukraine as well. So... Mm. Add, add to Iran their proxies. Mm -hmm. You've got Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. You've got the Houthis mm -hmm. in Yemen. You've got other groups out of Syria and Iraq, all potentially that would come into the mix mm -hmm. if there was a regional conflict. Mm -hmm. I say come into the mix. They're already there. Yeah. The attack on Saturday night also saw missiles and drones launched from southern Lebanon, from Hezbollah, and from Iraq and Syria as well. Not from Gaza but only because Israel has so degraded mm. the capability of Hamas mm. over recent months. They are not able to launch the rockets that they would normally would. OK. Mark, thanks very Thank much you. indeed for bringing us up to date. Mm. Mark, right there. Um, let's uh, find out what is happening uh, with uh, Rwanda and the Rwanda bill back in the Commons today. Yes, MPs are set to consider amendments from the House of Lords. This is after the Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, suggested over the weekend that the Home Office was ready to go in implementing the scheme and that flights could take off within weeks. Let's get the thoughts of political correspondent Catherine Forster this morning. Catherine, um, do you think that's likely then? Well, the government certainly seemed to think so. Rishi Sunak said by the spring. Uh, the spring ends at the end of May, but the government thinks certainly by the first week of June that they can get people on flights and off to Rwanda. It's now two years and one day since the then Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, announced this scheme. It feels like a very long time ago. But yes, as you say, MPs are back in Parliament. Uh, there will be about two hours, six or seven votes this evening uh, in the House of Commons, at which all the amendments put forward by the House of Lords will be voted down including one which was um, uh, particularly controversial. The House of Lords wanted a, an exemption for people that had supported the UK government, Afghan interpreters, for example, but the government is having none of it. It will go back to the House of Lords tomorrow, then back to the Commons. Uh, the government thinks it will be law by the end of the week. They've got a few bits and pieces to tie up then, not least who's going to actually take people to Rwanda. Rwandan Airlines doesn't seem to be keen. Uh, none of our carriers here want what they see as the reputational damage associated with it. I think uh, quite likely that the RAF will be prevailed upon. Um, Worth saying, the charity Care for Calais are already uh, getting volunteers. They're going to uh, target the people that are earmarked for these first flights and attempt to block those deportations in the courts. Of course, the safety of Rwanda bill in response to the Supreme Court ruling that Rwanda was not a safe country, the whole point of this legislation is explicitly to make sure that the courts will not block these flights. Uh, 
also news today uh, reported in the Times that the government is looking at other countries as well, potentially countries like Armenia, the Ivory Coast, Costa Rica and Botswana um, to take uh, people being deported in the future. But uh, yes, it's been a long road. There's a lot of scepticism as to whether anybody is ever going to Rwanda, but the government is hopeful that it will happen in, in the next few weeks. So we don't have very much longer to find out if Rishi Sunak's going to make good on those pledges. Catherine, thanks for the update. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Britain's newsroom at half past nine, Andrew and Bev. Uh, what will, you, will you be talking about Rwanda? Uh, slightly. A lick. Mm. Yeah, because they're, 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 we know they can't get an airline to take to take the, the plane, mm. the, 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 the refugees. So they're just they're simply going to they'll just lease a plane, mm. a commercial plane. Mm. I'm just reading today that we're also talking to Armenia, Ivory Coast, Costa Rica, and Botswana um, to see who they will take. Yes, this exactly. Goes ahead. I know, I know. Mm. Well, it would just be relieved when that flipping plane goes in the air and starts getting them out. Will it though? Will it? Will it? Will it? Will How it? many Let's people will so. be on? Although, it? if that does happen, then of course, if the boats don't stop, then the whole thing will have been mm. not the deterrent that they were hoping it mm. <laughs> to be. Um, we're also going to be uh, talking about, you know, smart motorways. We're all mm. familiar with the hideousness of smart motorways, mm. and now there's talk that they are going to be scrapped and hard shoulders will be put back. You think of the cost I of know, that. But it's the right decision. It's, it has to be it done. It has to be done. People have been dying in yeah. such high numbers. Well, who thought that wouldn't and who, happen? And who thought calling them smart was clever? <laughs> I know. Well, the anything is meant to who be. Who thought calling them smart yeah. was clever? Because yeah. they're, yeah. they're, they're stupid yeah. motorways. Yeah, yeah, but it... I suppose the idea was that they were to look reactive, they were to look computer reactive, that they could predict things and whatever. Mm. Absolute hideous. It was funny, yeah. driving down one... Uh, on Saturday, and um, and it said, um, uh, no hard shoulder in 15 yards, whatever it was, yeah. it said. And I suddenly went, what? And then I looked, and the hard shoulder disappeared. It just yeah. disappeared. And, and, you know, it went on like that for a mile or something. That's and, what they are. And, of yeah. course, it relies on whoever is watching the road to yes. put the sign up, yeah. and then it relies on the drivers to believe the sign. But also, it relies on the cameras to work. Mm. Yeah. And they don't always work. But, oh, but well, do you know, I'm not sure that that will ever come about because the cost we're talking huge cost here and the potholes in the roads will remain the same motorway yeah, maintenance yeah, yeah. remain the same and it will just be cheaper to leave them yeah. and it is wrong and it should go but yeah goodness. but if you're one of those people with those record number of people dying because they're sat in their yes. car and they oh, get hit the by a truck there is no cost that would be enough to save that person. Okay. Um, and also, uh, I think we're going to be, you're going to be doing it as well, but Meghan Markle's brother, um, who taken the has somewhat. taken the mickey out of mm. her enormously. Mm. Well, we go. Add, add that to the list. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good show. We'll Thank see you. you very soon. Uh, the Great British Giveaway. It's a great crow cruise, even. Have a go. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. From another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good luck, and wouldn't that be fabulous? It's just what we fancy. We talk about it every day, but I think that just looks like the best prize ever. Um, stay with us, though. Lots more still to come. We're on air uh, for another 15 minutes, and we're going to be talking about Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. They're back in the news. Uh, we'll tell you all about why after this with Angela Levin. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 
and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. Do you think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where we need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this this, is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it would destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a of primer but, stove and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. So we're, uh, we're now going to talk about Meghan and Harry. Uh, there was a polo match uh, they took uh, part in in uh, Miami. And uh, we've got Angela Levin, royal correspondent here, uh, to talk about that. And there will be other royal stories as well. So what have you picked up from this, uh, this polo match? Well, the, the interesting thing is, is that it, the polo thing that's going to be photographed and filmed for Netflix, this is Harry's one. Yes. But there was Meghan centre stage and um, she stood there with holding the treasure. Yes. And um, actually who she pushed around was a doctor, Dr Sophie Chankuka, who's chair of Santabli, the charity that they're doing it for. And she was asked if she would take the trophy. And she said, yes, that's why she came, because um, the money from the polo match is going to this yes. charity. Uh -huh. And and um, Megan had to push her out of the way because she wanted to be in the middle. I've never heard such a disgusting, rude thing to do. But do we take away from this, um, and we talk about this woman in many situations over, over a few years now, that at the end of the day, she's an actress. She knows how to take centre stage. Yes, but this was... Um, Bullying, you know, she... Actual physical she went, pushed she, her. No, she didn't actually physically push her, but she wanted to go next to Harry because it was her charity that they were worth yes, paying yes. for. And she said... Mm, mm, and she didn't move. And, she, mm -hmm. and so she bent down under the trophy and then went the other side of Megan and then she's all smiling. Now, I mean, that turns my stomach, actually. Yeah. I mean, anybody would know that that's... Not appropriate. But it gives her the power of the picture, doesn't it? Yes, but she shouldn't be in the middle because she's got two things that she's doing for Netflix and she's talking about food and household and friendship and um, making a friends and arrangements and cooking, all that. She, let Harry have a little 
something of his own. He scored the goal that made them win. And you'd think it, she would be really pleased. Mm. She pecked his lips, he pecked her lips. It wasn't actually a great passionate kiss, as the paper said, because it didn't last more than a second. Um, and I just, I just felt, you know... It, it's just crushed him to mm. nothing, really. Well, her brother is among those who are lining up to uh, rib her and, her and, and attack her half-brother yeah. um, in his YouTube channel. There he is sporting a wig, pretending to be her. Yes. Um, he's been criticised for trolling. Oh, there's also a, a pillow stuffed well, up his T-shirt for some Markle reason. Well, Thomas is, you know, a difficult character. He's now 57. And you wouldn't think he would do such a childish thing. So, he says he's got it on YouTube and he's got over 36,000 followers. So he's very determined. And he said that, you know, if she's got the right for free speech, so have I. But that's not really free speech. I mean, whatever my was feelings it are. Like or, it's, mm. Well, it's, it's just silly child. Well, it's family. I mean, it's yes. shocking well, I mean, that... I think she's treated her family very badly, apart from her mother. And I think he wants to get back. I think he's very frustrated that he can't actually say anything or do anything himself, and he wants to put her down. But I don't think that's the way to do it. I mm. think that's awful. I mm. think it's really... It's, it's, it's terribly childish, actually, to try and do that. So they're up and running again. Um, we thought that their, their TV deals had uh, bitten the dust and whatever, but Netflix have come to them again and said, right, we will resurface with you two, and these are the roles that you've got. How did they divide up the future contract? How is it? Well, cool. Megan is the one who's going to be at home, the guru is at home, and um, Harry is going to do talking about polo, and we're going to know about polo, how exciting it is. I don't think he'll touch on how it's supposed to be the most sexy mm. um, game, uh, but uh, there's a lot of that around, but I don't think Harry would dare to say anything about that. But he, she, he's not necessarily going to be around Megan. She's mm. going to do this. She's going to tell us all how to do it. But... Um, one of the problems why she's put it off for so long is that people don't want to buy into it, saying, yeah. you know, who wants to be like Megan? Mm -hmm. so do, you I think, think... do you think there will be a reunion? He's back in the UK, isn't he, for his Invictus Games um, next month, um, and there are other dates in the diary over the summer. Um, we know that he flew over when he learnt the news about his father's cancer, and apparently, if you believe what's written in the papers, uh, the King is trying to play peacemaker between the brothers. Do you think there's any chance of a I reunion? I don't think he's necessarily trying to make peace between the brothers. I think he knows he's got to look after himself. He's trying to do as much as he can for the country, at home meeting people and dealing with all the paperwork. Um, I think Camilla will not let Harry <coughs> stay... Excuse me, you. sorry. <laughs> I don't think uh, Camilla would let him stay on his own with Harry. She was there when he came for the 15 minutes when he knew that he'd had... Cancer. I think that he's actually got an awful lot to do, and, um, and William will be not interested at all. I mean, he'll still be caring for his wife and the children, and I think all this is wishful thinking. Mm. I'm just Can reading... I just tell you mm. about um, Harry and Meghan's um, thing that they're doing at the moment? They're um, both of them doing uh, looking into election misinformation towards when the uh, election comes. Right. Now, this is not allowed for a, a prince of a, you, the UK to do that in America. This is what they're doing. Amer um, Meghan originally had Obama's PR team in 2020 because she wanted to start doing that. She worked with Gloria Steenham, cold-calling voters, mm. and was told not to do that. She's now 90, Gloria. And now she's doing all this about something called deep fake onslaught. And that is when you put different heads on people's faces and they're going around and doing all that. And a lot of Americans are absolutely furious because why are they yes. getting involved? She can't help herself. But does she also have political ambition? Well, I think she does, but she won't get anywhere because she's not while she's got her title and she's hanging on to the title for dear life. Yeah, yeah. It's very important that mm. she wants to stay with that title. She likes it. Because it's worth money to her, isn't it's it? It's worth money. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's what's actually very important to her. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just think the audacity of it is ridiculous, really.
Okay, Angela, thank you very much indeed for, for that insight. We've got to leave it there. Thank you. And uh, we'll say goodbye to all of you watching and listening today. We'll be back tomorrow morning. Same time, same place, same channel. Yeah, have a fabulous Monday. In the meantime, we'll leave you in the capable hands of Andrew and Bev. That's after your weather forecast. Have a good day. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So a very blustery and showery start to the day this morning with brisk northwesterly winds. That will help clear a band of rain across southern and eastern parts out towards